and we're live. Hello. Oh, Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Bonar Jamboree. We've been waiting to do this episode for years and years. Today is finally the day. Yep, we got to be doing the Bonars today. You want to talk about these Bonars? You want to talk about these Bonars? You going to have some more fun than a bale of hay. You want some stew? I make some stew. I got stew for yeah, you. After all, we got plenty of hillbillies in this shower. I'm Hillbilly uh, Harold. And this here is Kyle. He's a hillbilly. He lives on a farm of cows and pigs. And here we got our bold buddy Ryan. And we got Ham in the chat with us, too. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be a part of the Hoot Nanny. <laughs> it's, a... it's funny you say that because that's one of the gifts I've chosen. Wait, what? <laughs> oh, hell yeah, dude. Why is my mic? The peaking? reason what why the we're hell? talking about hillbillies. Is because we're talking about the bug bars. Yep. Uh, we can turn this off now if it's playing at all. <laughs> all righty. Uh, we get, this is um the third to last tribe, because the last two ones are, last three ones actually are a damn mouthful. So this is going to be a a very chatty episode because there's a lot of stuff to get through with this one, which is why we have four people for this. Yes. All right, we have a Bonar aficionado with us. Ham is playing a Bonar in our live play. Yes, I am. They are honestly, I think, one of my favorite tribes, if not my favorite. And why? Um, why did you pick of all tribes the Bonars to be your favorite? Uh weird one. I wanted something very post-apocalyptic, but modern day, and I'm like, wait, Bonars are like they're the survivors. That fits with the theme, and then two. Hobo with a shotgun is it, it's a uh that's a classic trope. <laughs> yeah, it's a Born trope life. and it's it's a trope for a reason. <laughs> like this is one of the few times where you can be like I am a literal murder hobo and it'd be like okay, yeah, you're that kind of makes sense with what you're doing. Yep. And I'm using my resist uh, toxin gift to drink this shitty worm beer that I have in celebration of the episode. Yep, I I've gone back to drinking bush ice too because I've given up on the whole boycott shit. I've got vodka yeah. and cranberry juice. All right. God help you. I have uh, a Starbucks Paradise drink, coconut beverage. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. This that is good he fished enough. out of a sure dumpster. <laughs> mm. All right, I'm already I've already been drinking. Let's start. Yes, history. The the history. What begins every story with the World of Tribes? Uh, you know this one. The worm. Well, yeah, we have the worm. But uh, the worm ends up talking to humans, which leads to... Uh, the the Impergium? Yes! Killing humans. The, the, our story will begin with the Impergium. Now, the Bonars, as we know, before... The Imperium really happened. No tribe really had a name or much of an identity, but we knew who was going to wind up in what tribe, depending on what happened during that time before the Neolithic Age. And the Bonars were a bunch of Omegas who were treated like shit uh, before and after the Concord. And before a tribe even formed, these were just guys that nobody gave the time of day and everybody just spat on. Guys that would never have an authority position. And when the Imperium happens, funny enough, these guys don't really talk about it. But when, when I'm looking at their, their history, they barely managed the Imperium at all. Uh, mentioned the Imperium at all. I guess they were ashamed about it or something. Well, it's more like we're being given this uh, command by a higher power that doesn't respect the thing we say. Why are we going to go along with the thing they tell us? Well, they aren't. It's like um, it's like what you can relate to right now with uh with quiet quitting, of I'm not going to do my I'm not going to do this job. I'm just going to do it incredibly half-assed, and if the if the surfing's going to get in my face about it, uh, big deal. What are they going to do? Fire me? Execute me? My life can't get any worse. I mean, yeah, that does make sense. <laughs> like also, I'm looking through, I'm looking through both books for this information. I think I posted a while ago in the uh, in the usual chat 
it's a it's a little bit up there. The artwork in Bonar's first edition is fantastic, dude. Like, look at some of these picks up here. Uh, it's in history pages, right? No, it's in usual chat. You gotta scroll up for a little bit for it. All right, let me. Hey, drag my. Because yeah, oh. I'll. Yeah, these do look yeah. cool. Let me put some. What? what yeah, which they... one do you want me up on the on the uh, screen? Uh, just 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 any of them, really. I don't know which who which artist specifically because there's three different people credited for artwork in the first edition book, but all three of you did a fantastic job. I, I'm just going to assume all three of you had a, had an equal hand in doing this. Yeah, this is fucking tight. Yeah, it it really feels like apocalypse too. It feels Especially like the guy with the. With the army helmet smoking. Yeah you, yeah, you know what this feels like? It feels like Ralph Bakshi's Wizards. It, it really does. And uh, that's really, that's an awesome movie if you haven't checked it out. Check out Ralph Bakshi's Wizards. I, I, I'd highly recommend I, it. I have no idea what streaming service it's on now. I don't know. It's probably on like Daily Motion or something. The one of the car probably. that looks like it's going to eat some, like the dog. Just it makes yeah. me think of Brave Little Toaster and that song Worthless. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. Exactly. It it does they actually. Gonna, they get to touch all the singing cars in their cars. That is a kind of fucked up scene if y'all remember that movie. It's, I actually love this dude with like the werewolf with the dreads and a gun in his hand about to kill a worm creature. Mm. I think that's fucking tight. Yeah, and the same with like the xenomorph in that one picture. Oh yeah. Like it, all of it, all of it looks awesome. So safe to say, the Bonars didn't really participate in the Imperium, because first and second edition just has no mention of the Imperium or them really participating in it. So we skip on to the Concord then. All right. And of course, the War of Rage happened during this time. The Bonars don't talk about that either. The Bonars didn't really get involved in much shit, really. I mean, these guys just kept to themselves. Well, really, they're just trying to survive. I mean, they're, they've are they been destitute their entire history. They're just trying to live. And back then, you didn't exactly have human civilization to live off of. You had to get all of this food yourself. And you remember the litany. The pack alphas always get the first of the kill. You're eating bones and carrion. And that's not a way to live for a wolf. <laughs> now, Absolutely is it? Absolutely not, no. Nope. And you may think, why are they named the Bonars? It's because the Silverfangs named them that. They said during the, the writing of the litany, after refusing to let them vote, they said, this group right here sucks and should be given nothing but bones to gnaw upon. Which is where they got their name. Uh, once again, another classic Silverfang W. Man, fuck the Silverfangs. The... They get all the leftovers. Hey, it, you know you're a terrible leader when you make the Ventru look great. In comparison. So we skip ahead to the Concord. Around this time, Rat became their totem. Because Rat saw how destitute they were. And the Ratkin... We'll get, we'll get to the Ratkin in their own episode. But they just recently had their dreams of world supremacy destroyed after the War of Rage. So Rat, being the opportunist that he is, looked at the Bonars and said, Hey, life kind of sucks for you guys. Team up, team up with me. And I'll feed you. I'll keep you warm. I'll share my Ratkin cairns with you. And you'll start making a name for yourselves. And behold, sold. Rat's their totem. And then they start wearing the name Bonars as a badge of honor. Namely because we're going to take this insult. And we're going to spin it. And we're going to make the best of ourselves what we possibly can be. And we don't need the sewer fangs. We can just do this on our own. Because for all, most through most of their history, the Bonars, once again, keep to themselves. And, uh... I mean, they just few... they Yankee doodled the title. Exactly. <laughs> a few Bonars looked over at the, the Glasswalkers... And they were considering joining the Glassworkers, but then Rat grabbed a few Bonars that were thinking that and said, No, you're not joining the, the Warriors of Men. You're definitely not doing that. I don't like Cockroach. I don't trust Cockroach. If you join Cockroach, I'm going to put a hit out for you. And of course, nobody 
who is a Bonar wanted to join the glass workers after Rat said that. <laughs> you don't mess with Rat. We're going to go into detail about Rat later. Yep. There were um, there were a few Bonars that followed Jekyll, but Jekyll isn't much of a totem anymore, and we'll get into why um, right now, actually. Uh, also, a uh, funny thing to all the people that say we want wolves in Africa, uh, this tribe started in Africa. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That is true. Uh, I mean, you keep, you keep complaining about, where's the African werewolves? Where's the African werewolves? Uh, right here they are. Right fucking here. Right here. Yeah. Uh, how about you read the damn source material instead of complaining? That and the frickin' uh, singing dog. Not the singing dogs. The, uh, that one band of red talons. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, true. That uh, the, the painted dogs. The, the 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 Kuchiwikidu. yeah. And behold, you you can have a you can have a chronicle that takes place in Africa, guys. Seriously, namely they were in West Africa. Just think Ethiopia, Somalia, Uganda. This is around the this place that they live. And what's going on during this time, Kyle, with the Silent Riders? Oh, they were trying to kill Set. And a few Bonars made the mistake. Of saying we we want to join in on killing set, and they were grossly underprepared. If you read the Ebony Kingdom supplement for werewolf, of for, I'm sorry for vampire, you know that the Ebony Kingdom doesn't exactly have much of a hierarchy. I mean, most games that are werewolf uh, vampire games that take place in Africa, it is a lot of I am a vampire. I have magic powers. Follow me, tribesmen, and I will lead you to greatness. And it's pretty much everyone is playing Civilization 1v1v1v1v1v1v1 with very loose alliances. So the Bonars are thinking, oh, Set's just a guy by himself. This is going to be fine. No, this is a guy with an entire kingdom. And when the Bonars go in, they start getting killed by the Methuselahs because they're working together. And the Bonars say, man, fuck this shit. And they get right out of Egypt before the fight's over. They, they ran away. They ain't gonna lie about that. Well, I mean, they didn't know what they were up against. I imagine the silver, the shadow, the silent striders didn't tell them. It's, they probably said, "Hey, uh, we got this snake over here, Cobra. Uh, she's teaching us damn the heart flood. You guys want to learn that? No, nah, we're gonna be fine. You, you sure about that? This is my person. Nah, we're good. And then it comes the day of the fight, and they start getting their asses kicked. Well, no, that's your own damn fault then. It it really is. You you didn't come prepared enough. And look, and think about it. No, no, no. Think about it this way: if those Bonars would have learned Dan the Heart Flood, and not and the and the Silver and the Shadow. Sorry, I keep getting all my S's mixed. And the Silent Striders were the ones to kill Set. Then the Bonars would have that gift too, and everything would have been fine. You, you would have horrible luck as a vampire in the world of darkness if Absol you had two tribes with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's, it also complicates matters that um, Rat hates Owl even before this event happened. Just Rat just did not like Owl. I mean, Owl was all for the collaboration saying, oh, all these Bonars are joining us in the fight against Set. Cool. But Rat said, if you stick around the Silent Striders for too long, I'm revoking all of the gifts I gave you. Just Rat just hates Owl that strongly. Was that to guess why? Well, I uh, mean, oh god, owls like rats. Like, yeah, that's like their thing. That's true. It's just kind of, it's some dick behavior. I want to point out with rats is that you love the wild, you love nature until you're the one at the bottom of the food chain. Yeah, I'm starting to notice that about rat. He is really fucking petty. He yeah, is. Rat, rat is. Yeah, Rat, Rat is a dick, and he, he doesn't care about how dickish he is. He knows he's a dick, and he doesn't care. So in all honesty, the Bonars went from one dickish group of leadership, the fucking, sh the fucking Silver Fangs, to Rat and the abusive relationship he has with them. But you look at Rat. He has his own changing breed still. Are you going to say anything to Rat? I mean, yeah, that's true, and the Rat can are kind of scary. Yeah, <laughs> I would. Yeah, <laughs> oh, fuck him. Of course, the get yes, the get ephemeris with the, the get ephemeris Arun, Like, nah, fuck him. <laughs> and uh, funny thing, 
that curse that Set put on Owl, he also put on Jackal. It's because the Bonars that were fighting in Egypt followed Jackal. And Set conveniently didn't know that Rat was the head totem. Uh, that would have been pretty bad for the Bonars if he did know, but... Jackal got cursed, and all of his descendants just couldn't hang on to money. If any money comes into the possession of somebody who is a descendant of that tribe that followed Jackal, they can have no money on them at any long period of time. It just leaves their body. They just can't hold on to that money at all. Yeah. Very sp specific curse, but uh, guess what? These guys already didn't have anything. It just removed their upper mobility. They basically became forever untouchable. Now here's the part of the Silent Shredder's history that you don't get from their book, you get from the Bonar's book. After they were pushed out of Egypt, the Silent Shredders had a refugee crisis and started coming into Bonar territory, which pissed Rat right off that Owl's kids were coming into his territory. But rather than starting a fight, the Bonars took the high road and said, we'll just move. Because we, we can't share this territory with all these wolves, we're just going to spread out. And they went everywhere except the New World. They said, oh, we've got, uh, we've got this location uh, over here, uh, Europe. I mean, the Gaffinists are kind of scary. They don't make for very good neighbors, but we can live like this. They start moving to Europe. We're going to walk down this road. Oh, here, it's kind of cold here, but we can live here. They move to Russia. Check out this place. It's the Himalayas, and past here is this massive beach and a pretty nice place where there's very few vampires. There's the Kuei Jin, but we can handle them. They move to India. They start going across the sea to Indonesia, the Philippines, the entirety of Oceania, and then eventually Australia. Yeah, yeah, they had guys in Australia. They were hanging out in Australia. <laughs> like, oh, they went. There's a lot of other people. And these dude. really mean fucking werewolves here, but you know what? Eh, it's okay. Yeah, they they really did just go everywhere except for the Pure Lands because I don't think there was a ship that was seaworthy enough to get you to the Pure Lands yet. No. Well, well, no, there were. China had them, but they just didn't know America was a thing. You look at Chinese history, dude, China was so far ahead of everyone else, but they never colonized, and China would have taken over the world if they did that, way before the British Empire ever would have. Yeah, it's it's really <laughs> incredible just how far ahead they were, and then they kind of got fucking thrown back into the throes of whatever after fucking, after they got colonized. Kept, kept having wars with themselves and just kind of threw that advancement away, but now the world's eating out of their palm. Yeah, I might be wrong, but, like, I heard somewhere, like, China, for the longest time, was the place that had the shortest amount of actual peace time. Because, like, every few years, it would just go crazy again. Yeah, it was all the yeah, nobody... court culture and, and warlords around there. Nobody could agree on what the dynasty was supposed to look like. You had the Mongols, you had Japan, who fucking hates China. All these different wars going on. There's no peace in China. You want to talk about no peace in the Middle East? Nah, look at China, dude. <laughs> yeah, they they had some shit going on for hundreds of years, thousands even. Their, their last their last war ended in a genocide that killed 21 million. It reminds me of that fucking meme where it's like Western history versus Eastern history, and Eastern history it was like Chengdu meets Cajun in battle, 30 million perish. <laughs> you talk about how brutal the Romans were. Not nah, now, nah, just go to the Far East, dude. Yeah, they they had their shit fucking going wild over there, man. Yeah. Anyway, so the refugee crisis happens. Yes, and Rome is the next big plot point. Rome happens, and the Bonars that were hanging out in what would eventually be Italy looked over their shoulders at the. Ventru and the Malkavians and the Lasombra and the Toreador and said we ain't having any of that. Nah, after we got our ass beat by Set all those years ago, we're not doing this again and just immediately fled Italy when they saw all those vampires in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> and they immediately hopped into the Gaffinus Cairns. After they got their teeth punched out by the Gaffinus, they said, 
hey, there's this really scary civilization that we smell the worm all over. It's called Rome. Um, we can help you destroy it. And the Gaffinger said, deal. And they start raiding Rome. And then, of course, Roman history happens. The All the different tribes, they colonize and all the warfare that goes on, and eventually the Roman Empire collapses, becomes the Holy Roman Empire, splits into the Byzantine Empire, this, this great schism happens, Rome falls, the Byzantine Empire falls, boom, there's your history for you. We, we've talked about this you know, how many times already. You know what I always say, bet on the get. <laughs> but, yeah, Fenris will fuck you up. <laughs> now the thing is, the Bonars start doing stuff after the Renaissance. Around the point of the Middle Ages, you know Robin Hood? Yeah. Yes. Take the Disney movie. Swap out Fox for a wolf. There you have it. That's the Bonar's history. Huh. So there's a camp called the Hoods that we will talk about. It's not Hood Rats. It's Robin Hood that that's referring to. It's M.O.P.'s Robin Hood's remix is what it is. Yeah. And you have all these Bonars who are going around as highwaymen with bows and arrows stealing from the rich and giving to the poor. And they decide it feels really good to give the money that we can't keep to people who need it more than us. Because we can hunt, we can get our own food whenever. These guys, these puny humans can't. And it feels good to be a philanthropist. So this is what starts the whole ph philanthropist culture of the Bonars. And if I if I can take a shot at Rolf then for a second, they said at, at the start of their video on the Bonars that this was a group that was based in socioeconomic theories of socialism and communism. And that, I, that that's not it. You're you're the ones who are making it socialist. You're the ones who are making it communist. That has nothing to do with the Bonars. It's philanthropy that the Bonars do. Yeah, it, it has nothing to do with economic theory. If anything, the fucking children of Gaia are more are more socialist than the uh than the Bonars. The Bonars just want to try and help people. It's that they they see the destitute, they see the squalid, they see people that have no means of transportation who are eating polluted uh, like rotten food, who are living in their own shit and are saying we can help these people we can get up and leave at any time. And we're the ones that have the spirit powers and the hunting skills. They don't. Let's keep these guys alive. And we talked about the the Silver Fangs. Uh, no, not Silver Fangs, I'm sorry. The Silent Striders being heroes of the Gero Nation. The Bonars are up there too because of, think of how many people they saved by doing this, by showing charity. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're, they're actual good guys in the Garo. And they continue doing this. They start living the life of Robin Hood. Whether or not there was a Prince John involved, um, I don't know. The book doesn't say that. And the Sheriff of Nottingham was probably a good guy. Um, don't trust Disney just portraying anybody as a wolf. They probably were a good person. <laughs> Wasn't he a lion? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, Prince, uh, Prince John was a lion. But a very yeah. like small and, and, sort of, and sort of scrawny looking lion. Oh, the okay. sheriff of Nottingham was a wolf, but the sheriff of Nottingham probably could have been a werewolf, but he'd be like a Geta Fenris who just wanted money. No, I don't know. He'd be more Shadow Lord, or not not a Shadow Lord, a Silver Fang, probably. Just take, taking the money just just because I can. I'm I'm only doing this for Prince John because it makes me feel powerful. Yeah, basically. That's why he was singing Good the, old, uh, that's why he was singing the ballad in the movie. Good old asshole behavior <laughs> and what's the next up here um the black plague uh not very good when you're um homeless right no <laughs> i don't think that time period was good for anybody so after also 40 percent of europe dies what i said also true yes <laughs> well 40 percent of europe is dying the bonars find out who the culprits are. They look at Clan Bali, because Nurgle just reappeared and caused the Black Plague, and he teamed up with the Nefandi, the evil mages who worship evil. And they start hunting Bali vampires and Nefandi mages. 
And holy shit, do you have stones if you're going after both of them? And think of how many how many Bunars there would be during that period. Because the Robin Hoods would stay with the families they were helping and make kinfolk there. So around this time, you had a lot of Bonars roaming around Europe at this time. I think they... I think they might have been the majority werewolf compared to the Gav Fenris. Just because of how many people lived in Squalor back then. Well, yeah. And yeah. any amount of people, they, they were far more helpful than the Gav Fenris. And of course, Nurgle what? would eventually be found. <laughs> yeah, the... nonsense. <laughs> this is propaganda. <laughs> what is this worm propaganda that you're spewing? <laughs> the the Bonars don't get their hands on Nurgle. Someone else does. We'll talk about that later with the Bali. Uh, I would like to. I would love to do a Bali episode. But Monday. Nurgle gets what's coming to him. And the Black Plague eventually goes away, but something even worse happens. The Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects it. Guess who doesn't guess who doesn't have a place to hide? The Bonars. Nope. The Black Furies, of course, got um got found out during the Inquisition, and a, a few of them were staked and burnt at the stake. There was nowhere for a Bonar to run during this period, so a shitload of them died. That's probably the reason why the Bonars aren't the majority anymore, and that went to the Gea Fenris, because a lot of them were found by the Order of St. Leopold and the Inquisition and were killed. It, this was a big oh-shit period for the, for the Bonars. Not a very good time to be a, a BG. But don't worry... They get theirs the in 1540. BG, bad so, guy. Yep. The B B Bonar. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I see. Uh, of course, the guy famous would see the uh, guys living like this as bad guys. <laughs> what? Uh, I, I'm, the, I'm the hero of my own story. The world, about, the world does revolve around me. Yes, Grim is the protagonist. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> what do you mean? Grim is the antagonist. Okay, true, 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 very true. The, f the future villain of the game. He's been traveling with the main enemy this entire if time. If we play Hunter the Reckoning, then maybe. <laughs> so, imagine this. Ham. Yes. You, as Chico Largo, you're just well, minding your own business. It's 1540. It's the Renaissance. You just got done seeing some paintings. You just got done going to church. And you're walking there along, and you see a rat can pop his head off the ground in the woods, and he tells you to join him in the in the burrow. What do you do? Uh, probably say yes because if not, that's an angry like freaking rat can. But that's also such a bad deal. <laughs> no, this is a good deal. This this is a good deal. The rat can lead the Bonars into this massive moot led by the Ratkin. And Rat Incarna is sitting in the middle of it and says, I have a new idea. I've been thinking. I've come up with an idea. And it seems every time we try to help humanity, we get bit in the ass by something. It was the plague the first time. It was the Inquisition the second. To stop a third from happening, I am enacting the Ban of Man which is don't fuck with humans. Do not help a human because a human has the werewolves as their enemy in their mind. Don't kill humans because you need human waste to survive. It is don't help them, just live as parasites. That was the order that Rat gave and the Ratkin gave. And the Ratkin still follow it. What do we think of this? Bullshit. Yeah, Ever that's so uh, yeah. That's you like going the... from out destitute to below destitute. That's you. You go from philanthropy to parasitism. Yeah, it's yeah. Like you're not. Yeah. The only difference between you and vampires now is that you're not drinking their blood. You're you're eating out of their garbage cans, and that's pretty much it. You're you've reduced yourselves to wild animals. Which is what Rat wants. He likes the wolf part more than the man part. 
Well, the man part feeds rat's him a... too, so maybe he should shut the fuck up. Yeah, rat's a good person, right? <laughs> Jesus. But um, don't worry, the Bonars don't exactly follow this because for about a uh, hundred, two hundred years, they say, "All right, fine, ban of man." We'll just keep to ourselves, and the Bonars just keep their heads down throughout history. They're involved in a lot of stuff where anytime a tribe has an achievement, a Bonar is there helping them. But the Bonars don't put their name to anything, and they prefer it that way. They don't want the fame. They just want to know that they did the right thing. That's all that matters to them. They're still good people, even though they're living as parasites for 200 years. But 1776 happens. It's your favorite war, Kyle. The American Revolution. Yeah! And a whole bunch of Bonars go to America during this time. Because, like everyone, they're pretty sick of the British Empire. They start living in America and say, hey, this is great. Um, they don't fall head over heels in love with it like the Children of Gaia do. But the Bonars are having a great time. And then the... Well, they already weren't paying taxes because they couldn't afford it, but you start getting the stamp tax, the tea tax, the sugar tax, the the the, the red shoe tax, the black hat tax, just everything that the British is doing just to get more money out of America. So when a Revolutionary War happens, the Bonars say, you know, fuck the Banner Man, We're, give me a gun, I'm fighting the British. Well, they are technically doing well, their job fighting the technocracy then. And it's the order of reason where the guys who are behind the British Empire and the Sons of Ether were still the bad guys at the time. So, yeah, they're doing us a service by getting involved in that war. And Rat says, okay, here's the thing. You're breaking my law, but I'm going to give you an exception. If you stay in the Hamid form the entire war, I'll allow it. If I see you shift into Glabro, Kranos, Hamid, uh, oh, no, not Hamid, Hispo, or Lupus, I'm taking your powers away. And the Bonar said deal. So none of them shift into any of their other forms this entire time. So they just look like humans, but they're able to soak up bullets and eventually heal from them. And they're fighting alongside the American soldiers. And eventually, Battle of Yorktown, world turns upside down, American victory. Behold, you now have your own sovereignty. God damn it, I love this country so much. Not as much as a child of Gaia does. Yeah, close enough. And of course this is good, but what war happens right after this? Uh, the French Revolution. Or the French Revolution. And, Silver. Well, Silver. Well, well, not that one. Uh, this one no, beats no, no. The, um, the War of 1812 by about 12 years. Ah. Uh. Yeah, uh, I think... Is it the um the one I'm thinking about? No, no, it is the French Revolution. Yay! Oh, okay. And the French Revolution happens, but now the Bonars begin to lose sight of what they're doing because the Bonars in France go after the Wormish aristocrats because you know France was corrupt as hell during this time. It needed a change. But at the same time, you know what happens after the war is won by the rebels. Um, not very good, right? Yeah, Robespierre <laughs> went, hey, let's chop everybody's heads off. You can make religion out of this. No, don't. And then it, it just paves the way for Napoleon Bonaparte to take over. And behold, we swap out one devil for another. And... This is kind of the issue why... This is my issue with revolutionary talk today. Because, oh, this uh, this country is oppressive and needs to be restructured. Okay, what are you going to replace it with? The American Revolution, we had a very clear idea what we were going to do after chasing the British out. The French Revolution, it was overthrow the monarchy. And then there was no plan after that. And they were like, and oh, the now began to fall in. The Bonars began to fall into that, saying... We overthrew the worm. Now what? I mean, uh, none of us are involved in politics. None of us really know how to lead because we're all lower class. We're all bottom of the pack. Um, what do we do? And it just leads to more people dying. Heads are ruling left and right. And the Bonars end up um, really with no victory after the French Revolution. 
Uh, nobody wins. You yep. know who does win? Clan Bruja. Yep. Played right into the hands of Clan Bruja with that one. I mean, that, that really is like the issue. I, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself. It's, it really is the issue with modern re revolutionary talk. You can't talk about overthrowing a government without having a plan about what you're going to replace it with. Yeah, see, the, 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 yeah. Constitution, the Constitutional Convention of the United States was comprised of some of the greatest Western minds in the, in the 18th century. Was just absolutely, was just some of the smartest people that we could possibly find, some of the most enlightened minds came together to make a new form of government that hadn't been done in, in millennia. And so, you know, then the French Revolution happened. They didn't have a George Washington or an Alexander Hamilton or uh, or Thomas Jefferson. Like, yeah, Thomas Jefferson came over to help draft the their their constitution, but they never really followed it. And then Robespierre then, did the whole order of reason. It reminds me it, of a quote from G.K. Chesterton. Before you remove a fence, know the purpose of the fence. And we talked about him during our vampire game, uh, Marquis de Lafayette, just how badly they fucked him over after what he did for his country. Yeah, and he and he yeah. was here at the for the American Revolution as well. He fought alongside Washington, decided to go back to France, and then lost everything. Exactly. It uh just the entire catastrophe of that war. Yeah. <laughs> um Flapper does, so, a, does oh, my... a great video on the French Revolution. I'd highly recommend it. And the reason why this is so on my mind right now is because, you know, civil unrest in America at the moment. I'm pretty sure that if that if that unrest ever did go hot, it would just be a repeat of the, of the French Revolution. Nothing good would come of it. Well, there's so many different, like, colliding political factions nowadays. And because, like, no moderate position has ever managed to make a change that anybody can agree upon nowadays. It's like everybody's getting pushed to more and more political extreme territory, and then you just be winded up with a giant mess of factions fighting for control over something that doesn't that wouldn't really exist if you tore it down in the first place. Which is why a, a second American revolution would never work, because it would just be a free-for-all. It would, and I'll, it would just be mindless bloodshed, nothing would get done, and thousands would perish. See, oh no, Ryan! What? Oh no! Oh no! Oh, no. What happened? I think oh, he no. disappeared. Oh, there he is. There he is again. <laughs> Wait, what happened? Well, with, all right. Well, with the return of Ryan, we'll go on to our next point. Okay, cool. Sorry about that, right. my Discord just decided to close. I haven't had happens. Which, uh, the American Civil War. Um, you're noticing that they stopped following the Ban of Man. Right. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. And they celebrate the American Civil War by going around and shooting slave masters in the head with guns. Based. <laughs> that, that that pretty much is what's described in the book. Bonar saw Django and went, you know, that looks pretty cool. We should do that. Granted, you're doing something a little bit more virtuous than the French Revolution with this one, because you are freeing people from slavery. You're not exactly leaving them in an underground railroad or anything. They did help Harriet Tubman a little bit, but it's the same time as that. You're free. Now what? So I mean, it, there's a reason why even after the Civil War ended, a lot of black people were still in destitute situations because, you know, nobody would hire them, and boom, segregation happens all over. Is that If that's the case, then does that make John Brown a bonar? Yes, that would that make that makes total sense. Yes. Uh, next revolution, uh, because the Bonars just feel they need to get involved with every war after this happens. Uh, the Russian Revolution, and we know how fucking disastrous that was. Yep. Yep. Again, yep. a Bruja thing. Yeah, yeah the the Bruja ate very well after that, and the Shadow Lords ate very well. After that, too, just those two profited, but they did not have the Russian people in their hearts, in their minds when they did what they did. Everyone who tried, who actually believed in communism, got screwed over 
<laughs> at the end of the revolutionary uh the Russian Revolution. <laughs> Wonderful, right? Yep. They basically and just said, course, Hey, we got this new system that's supposed to help people and eliminate poverty and make people more productive. Hey, let's round up and shoot everybody that's productive. You notice there's a rivalry between the the Bonars and the Bruja. It seems to point. happen a lot. Yeah. Every every time a revolutionary a revolution happens, those two are present. But the Bonars are trying to help people. The Bruja just cause chaos wherever they go. I mean, that's that is the issue with the Bruja is that they're so determined to make a point that they miss the point of making a point. They just cause chaos and destruction for the sake of chaos and destruction, and they're going to bring the whole world down with them. This is why the Anarch just doesn't work as a faction in, in Vampire. Well, there has to Ugh. be some kind of structure. Like there, it's very hard to just have nothing because well, well that's the, the structure is uh, blood bonds. That's it. You yeah. feed somebody your blood, and then they have to do what you say because of blood bonds. Well, yeah, but that's the that's the thing. It's like unfettered, unfettered anarchy. Absolutely no government whatsoever will ultimately, at some point, resurrect tyranny in the form of Darwinism. And now you know how to argue with Malkaf in our New York game. I've been thinking about that for a while, but that's besides the point. Yeah. Anyway, uh, what happens next? The nineteen twenties. And boom, everyone gets money if you want to work in the factory. So the Bonars say, uh, fuck it, let's get jobs. Let's go work in the factory. Let's build cars. It sounds like a good idea, right? Oh, yeah. And the Bonars start making some money, and a few of them manage to save it. And around this time, a new totem forms. The American Dream. <laughs> yeah, buddy. A, a very abstract totem. That represents an ideal more than an animal. Um, granted, it works. If you work hard enough, eventually you'll see the fruits of your labor pay off. I mean, don't be like Karl Marx and sit around and say, why isn't the government paying me for being so smart? <laughs> yeah, go get a job. Get a job. Get a job and hot yeah. paper driveway and run over to money like the rest of us. See, just, just go around with a half-empty bucket of... Uh, what is it, uh, tar, uh, tar for your asphalt, and say, uh, hey, uh, our boss said we're we gotta throw this out, but we can give it to you for about um, eighty dollars for half half the barrel, <laughs> for half a bucket of asphalt. And what happens around this time, Ham? A certain vampire clan that wears its head. Oh, is this uh, where? Wait, at this point. I, it, wait, they yeah. interact with Killian Zamichi? No, the Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. When the stock market crashes, the Bonars are the people that everyone goes to. Everyone goes to the Bonars because they know how to get food, how to live off the land, how to make do with what you have in the city. The Bonars become philanthropists again after the Great Depression. But somebody rears their head. We see a creepy guy. He's got no hair. He's got pale skin. You grab him. It's a vampire. It's a Nosferatu specifically. And you give him the stink eye. And the Nosferatu says, Wait, don't kill me. I can help you get more food. And you say, go on. And so the Bonars follow the Nosferatu into their havens. They follow the Nosferatu into the havens. And behold... They actually have a lot of stuff, and they start talking. It turns out the Nosferatu aren't that different from the Bonars. They're both treated like shit in their own factions, in their own shadow governments. They both look like shit. They both really love each other, their own clansmen, their own tribemen. And they tend to have a lot of people within their circle that are poor and squalid. So they think... You have a lot of information. We're incredibly deadly. Let's join forces. And so a non-aggression pact between the Bonars and the Nosferatu is signed in the 1930s. Crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it's around this time that the Glasswalkers become this tribe's mortal enemy. 
Because who did they team up with, Kyle? <laughs> oh, um, I know, I know the Camarilla in general, but I'm forgetting the. Oh no, the Giovanni. Yep, yep, the Ghostbusters vampire. Busta makes me feel and good. They look at this, and around this time, Bonars are trying to form unions. They're trying to help people. They're trying to be philanthropists, and the Giovanni just have something to say about everything they're doing to try to help people the mob keeps getting in the way and a a werewolf tribe is helping them and it's the glass workers excuse me you see what the why the bonars really hate the glass workers because of this <laughs> they keep getting in the way of us trying to help people and they're only trying to help themselves at this point because the glass workers this was during their insane libertarian phase, where every glass worker is trying to advance themselves and only themselves, and they're killing each other in the streets. And you see how that flies in the face of the current Bonar value? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, um, around this time, the Bonars say, we need to start spying on the glass workers and make sure they don't start getting in our way. And they know about the Giovanni Alliance. They know they can spill the beans about the Giovanni Alliance whenever they're ready. But the Giovanni had too much power at the time for them to reveal that secret because the Giovanni is going to send their zombies and their ghosts after you. But now that the Giovanni has kind of sort of collapsed, the glass workers have now become so incredibly powerful, nobody can do anything about them. You can't say anything anything to the glass workers because the glass workers will become your enemy and that's a fight that you are going to lose no matter who you are if you go head to head with that tribe damned if you do damned if you don't that's where they're at and there's one more bit of history before it kind of peters out world war ii and we talked a little bit about this with the shadow lords Around this time, the Shadow Lords were hiring werewolf mercenaries to fight the war of uh, World War One and Two, and of course, the Bonars want to make some money, so they join in. They become mercenaries, and uh, everything's going good. Everything's going good in Germany. We just overthrew Berlin. Uh, what's that? The newspaper says um, a, a nuke. Uh oh. Uh oh, Kyle. <laughs> That's not good. And the Bonars, as the tribe say, well, that's it. That's the end. The world just, just ended. 1945, it just ended. Uh, Oppenheimer destroyed the world. Now we need to stop pretending that we can save Gaia from the apocalypse. We need to prepare for the post-apocalypse. And that's where the Bonars are now. They have been preparing for 80 years. How far do you think they will have made it? I imagine they've got some, uh, they've got some fallout shelters. Got plenty of shelters and... I more absolutely than likely, don't know that they have fallout shelters. They definitely do. These guys are doomsday preppers. These are like your, um, they pretty much are everyone living in the deep south that's preparing food five years in advance with peach preserves, has their own armory, has a fallout shelter dug beneath their house two stories down. Yeah. They're ready for the... They're ready for the world to end. Yeah, they're, they're, they're literally, not nice themselves. They're the survivors by any means necessary. And uh, now we go into their culture. And these guys have really silly ass names. <laughs> yeah, I've noticed that. Like, I love the I love the thief called uh, Not Here. And you also got a uh, burger with fries. Um <laughs> What was it, uh, 500 cent? What was a Bonar? That's incredible. And they all give themselves these really weird deed names. <laughs> I mean, I'm here for them. I like it. Absolutely. And upon, um, five auspices, um, these guys already make for pretty good spies. The reason why they hang out in cities so much was to spy on the Giovanni, but now it's just spy on the worm in general because Pentex formed, and Pentex has a lot of money. So they're spying on Pentex for the World Nation. That's what they're doing as the Ragabash. 
and there must be a lot of ragabashes amongst the, the, the Bonars, because the majority of these guys are spies nowadays. These guys will go around and spy on any worm activity. They'll pretend to be just some sort of bomb on the side of the road, but really, that's a werewolf. And the minute they get confirmation that, yes, you are a worm cultist, the whistle is blown, and all the werewolves raid you and kill you. Great strategy, right? Oh, I think it's great. Absolutely. Next up is the Bonar Theur, who's the guy on the side of the street with the sign saying the world will end. And you know where I'm going with this. Repent to Jesus, the world's going to end tomorrow. He's on the <laughs> side of the road with a He's on the side of the road with a Bible, but that's not actually a Bible. That's a little document that's going to get you indoctrinated into a tribe. So, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Theurgis were ha had this massive rink where they were recruiting other people to become kinfolk. Because the Bonars have a lot of kinfolk, dude. Imagine just how many people are poor in America, and then how many people are poor globally. These guys are talking to a ton of humans. Well, they're there to help. I think, I think, what well, we say? We said the, uh, it's a toss up between Shadow Lords, Bonars, and Children of Gaia as to who has the most members amongst the tribes. Yeah. Uh, the, the Bonars are pretty high up there. I think the Shadow Lords have more territory than they do members. Yeah. Given that Russia pretty much belongs to the Shadow Lords now because they control the Russian government. Yep. The, the Surfangs can cry all they want. We don't care about the Surfangs. Fuck the Surfangs. <laughs> all right. Why we haven't done their um, tribe book yet. Full of docs. Um, have any of you played Yakuza 7? No. no. I can't say that I have. There is a character in it that's known as the Chief, who is this chief of a homeless camp. And he decides who gets to be brought into the camp, who gets what's money... Uh, who gets to uh, eat which food, and that's pretty much the the Phildox, is that you're the, the chief of the homeless camp when you play a Phildox Bonar. Yeah, that um, sounds about right. Pretty easy to explain with them. Uh, Galliard, uh, name any street musician. A Annie Busker. Uh... And behold. Just go out there on the street with your bucket drum and your two flip-flops and play some drums. And people will give you money just to have you stop, but no, they, you think they want more. And that's how you get your money, as a galliard. Yeah. Basically. Go on the street and, and play... The, go on the street where shoddy clo it. playing a saxophone. Be awesome. And play as badly you the as possible. possible. Like the John Tron did like in the video. Maybe just stop. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 that whole video of the reporter of, I will pay you $100 if you will fuck off. Yep. There is a scheme, by the way, now that we're talking about this, that homeless people will squat on people's property, and if you don't call the police, the, uh, the homeless man will start asking, pay me X amount of money, and I will stop squatting on this property. It doesn't it's work. a little racket you can do in the realty game. No, that's funny. Um, I know it's a... I know that because it was a plot point in your case is zero. I haven't looked it up and see how well it works yet. Uh, post in the comments if you if you're a squatter, let us know. <laughs> Educate us on squatters, right? <laughs> if, I know. If, uh, according to if uh, someone you know uh, if someone's on your property for more than seven years, they legally have claim for that property. That's funny. Oh, in North Carolina, in North Carolina, it's uh, six months. That's all you need. Bro, I could build a shack in North Carolina and fucking live there. Dude, dude, just move down here. Just move down here. Stop paying rent. Just get the shack. Yeah, I'll get the hobo shack I, and live out in the I, fucking I bayou. Can send you, live I can like send you a Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> yes, absolutely, dude. I can, I can send you a tiny house video where people are taking shipping containers and turning them into houses. Yeah. And you can do that. Chuck a couple of solar panels up there and I'm set. All right, behold, why are you spending this much on rent? Move to the country, dude. Move to the country, live in a shipping container, eat fucking, uh, eat, eat jambalaya. It'd be great, dude. Eat, eat Little Caesars pizza and McDonald's hamburgers. <laughs> like five-day-old Caesar salad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Bonar Arun, let me read this one verbatim. Bonar Arun fight dirty. 
and they fight to win. Their strength doesn't lie in muscle, but in cunning. Masters of sabotage, street fighting, and swarm tactics. They don't go all out in a fight unless they know the odds are on their side. In any other battle, they wear down their greatest enemies by harrying them with endless little attacks, sometimes letting their more egotistical Arun of other tribes sacrifice themselves in foolish bits of glory. The most extreme warriors of the tribe are experts in terror attacks, survivalist agendas, militant methods, and recreational demolition. Their numbers are increasing. That does not surprise <laughs> me. That sounds like fun. Well, hold, if you want to play a domestic terrorist in your game, <laughs> play a Bonar yeah, That sounds Their fucking awesome. Their gifts also, like, work really well for that. Yeah. And in terms of breeds, um, not that much different in breed, because these guys actually treat everyone equally. Because they're treated like shit, they don't do that to anyone else. So, Hamid, Lupus, um, Metis, you're all treated fine. The Lupus are known to act like dogs, though, because they live in cities. I would like um, to say, though, like, I was talking to John about this the other night because I was watching scenes from House of a Thousand Corpses. I would adore to do, like, Captain Spaulding as a as a Bonar Arun. That'd be so much fun. You live in a little shack, you have your little gift shop. They yep. kill people on the side. <laughs> yep, basically, just that and a red <laughs> talon being domestic terrorists in the Midwest. That'd be fucking sick. But. Uh, before we go into camps, what do you guys think of the traps so far? They're a lot more fun than I would have thought. Ryan, what about you? Uh, they're definitely interesting. I'll pay that much. <laughs> and of course, we know why Ham loves them so much. Yep, and he is correct. All right, let's go into camps. Sorry about camps. These are the, these are wild. All right, I've got a lot of notes on camps, so. Uh, starting off, let me get the, well, I'm going to get the other thing off since little transition there and bam transition. Cool. <laughs> Moving on to camps. We are going to start with the rat finks. So the rat finks, their main job really is to, uh, trade information. It's like, basically they want to, they're the guys that will, that will sneak into, you know, Pentex companies, learn all the secrets, learn all the ins and outs keep close ties with the kin working all those thankless jobs like clerks and and warehouse workers and just try and gather as much information as possible in order to give any other in order to give other people in their uh in their pack the best chance of gaining access to a place where they shouldn't be and fucking up the most shit possible they work with Nosferatu Ratkin Korax Kinfolk Anybody they can get information off of, they will they will work with them to make sure they get it a, done. A ghost. I work with a ghost. Nah, they're kind of scary. Anyway, yeah. uh, moving on from that, we have the Frankenweilers. They are <laughs> defenders of any city block that houses a work of art, whether it's an art gallery, whether it's a, a graffiti wall, a public display of art, a... Uh, an opera house, anything. They were known by many knaves throughout history. They were also known as the Hidden Knaves in the Middle Ages, the Court of Wonders in the Renaissance, the Phantoms during the uh, Industrial Period, and most recently their other moniker is the Theater Lupines. So basically, some of them will actually attempt to master certain arts or sciences and establish protectorates within art houses. And they believe that the best way to fight the worm in this regard <laughs> isn't just through direct conflict but more so through protecting and educating people on the beauty of the world i actually have a lot of respect for that yeah, you can click the meme chat and just pull up that picture <laughs> exact wait hold up hold up hold the fuck up what did you what are you doing <laughs> hey, <we're on> mute. <laughs> bruh what the fuck it you you walk over to your local community theater and you see this guy. Yeah, this is this is what the Frankenweilers do. They just sit on the street corner like this. There's a lot of those in, in there's a lot of those in the town near where I live. Uh, how how many Hey Arnold episodes 
were based around save the theater, save the school. And behold, I just watch an episode of Hey Arnold, you know how to play a bonar. Yeah, basically. Okay, so uh, uh what's up? My my parent my paranoia is acting up. Are we recording? Yeah, we're we're still recording. Uh, okay, good. Okay. okay. We talked about these guys earlier. The Hood, otherwise known as MOP's Robin Hood's remix. They sort of act independently from the rest of the Bonars. They are the classic Robin Hood. They rob for the rich, give to the poor, help the downtrodden, and fuck the wealthy. So, they will always offer to help anyone they see who is in trouble, and they make sure that they deliver results. To quote the book directly, in short, they give a damn. If you are on the street and you're and you're in a rough spot, you're getting kicked around by your boss, you're getting kicked around by your abusive ex-husband, talk to somebody from the hood. They will help you out. Nowadays, they do look like the actual hood rat um, because of where these guys typically hang out now. I yep. mean, there's the, Sher the Sherwood Forest doesn't exactly exist anymore. So, um, well, no, Nottingham Baltimore still exists. City, so I know a guy who lives there. Yeah. Well, Baltimore City, on the other hand. Oh, no, fuck Baltimore. So Don't go into Baltimore. The place sucks. <laughs> and uh, next up is probably my favorite. Uh, the deserters. So they are surrounded by death and poverty at all times, and so they fled into the Umbra. Their elders are always leaders in quests for some utopia within the Umbra to hide from the apocalypse. They're seeking portals to other worlds that might be better than the one they're living now. Most of the elders of this tribe have either been lost to complete delusion or have just resigned themselves to being destroyed in the apocalypse or just by death itself. And they just sort of wander between camps and embark on umbral quests whenever they, whenever they feel like maybe they have a little bit of hope of finding some paradise hidden deep within the Umbra. It's honestly a very tragic now you, tribe. Now, you remember, with the Stargazers, we talked about the Ammon Gammon, uh, the non-returners of the Stargazers. The guys how that often do you went... Think they, how, how often do you think these two cross paths? Probably very, very often, which is very concerning yeah. for the safety of the Bonars. Now, now, you see, the Bonars have the right idea because you can build a civilization in the Umbra, Talk to a mage, and they can tell you that's possible. So they're all into something here, and maybe they'll survive a nuclear apocalypse by living in the Umbra. Maybe not. Uh, it depends. Because you, you need life on a material plane in order for there to be life in the Umbra. Yep. But um, Mammoth is this thing. Mammoth is the, the Red Talon um, totem. And he's still alive. He's still in the Umbra. So... I feel like they're on the right track talking about the, the deserters. Really? I thought they were just kind of like, yeah. by how the book put it, just lost. Well, well, no, that's actually a pretty smart idea, because if you build your shelter in the Umbra, behold, you can like kind of sort of freely mold and mesh the Umbra. You need, you need Gnosis for that, but you can mesh the Umbra around. And behold, if you create a little hidey hole in the Umbra, it's already really hard to find somebody in the Umbra. Now with this, now with this, if you have a, the Black Spiral Dancers chasing after you, just go into your Umbra bomb shelter and wait for them to leave. They won't find you. Yeah, but alternatively, think about it this way. If the apocalypse does happen and the deserters do manage to build, like, cairns within the Umbra, wouldn't the destroyed world just be covered in worm creatures then? There won't really be much of a world left because once the worm kills everything, what do you think the worm's going to kill next? Well, himself. I mean, the worm wants to die. All Fomori and Black Spiral Dancers on a psychic level want to die. So once everything else dies, they're going to kill each other. And when all the killing is done, there might not be much of a world left, but the Bonars will still be alive, and that's something. Yeah, I, I suppose that's true. Maybe, I guess I didn't read into it enough, but I thought it was tragic, would, but now it's actually kind of smart. They would have to team up with the Void Engineers because Gaia would probably be barren. You might want to call up the Void Engineers and say, do you have room on your Mars base? Yeah, they might. 
Anyway, <laughs> moving on from this, probably one of one of my favorite uh, camps in this uh, in this tribe, the Road Warders. I actually, when I was reading the book, I read it wrong as Road Warrior, and I thought, "Holy shit, I can have a Mad Max character." But yeah, you well, basically you can. can. <laughs> yeah. So these guys hate to stay in one place for long. They only join packs temporarily when they're like in the neighborhood. Basically, they are fiercely devoted to Rat, but. And they, how, however, they do occasionally, because of their nature, work with Silent Striders, or, albeit very reluctantly, given their devotion to Rat. However, unlike the Silent Striders, they believe that the journey is a destination in of itself, and that the road that they travel is what they're is what they're trying to protect, rather than you know wherever they're going. And in doing so, they work as messengers, as couriers, as diplomats, and they're always around to help other Garrow who happen to be stranded along the road. They're they're like they're like the guy that's willing to pull off at the side of the road if they see your car broken down and help you out. There is a fingerprint of Cyberpunk twenty twenty in this game. With with the board, with the road wardens, they're a lot like the nomads. I'm noticing. Yeah, they really and, are. And of course, nomads don't pay taxes, and they have their own little economy based around trade. I give you bullets, you give me guns. I give you car parts, uh, for trade. And behold, once again, they don't really need the girls in society. They have their own. They have themselves. The Bonars are doing just fine, dude, with what they have. If I may. <clears throat> Based. <laughs> Just like take them out of the 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 far part of the political compass, the the lip left. Put them in lib center. That's where they are. I like that. I anybody who's lib center, I'm good with that. No, okay, the, the extreme libertarians. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Uh, moving on from them, uh, the guys who we were impersonating at the start of the video, the hill folk. Uh, the hell folk. So, them's here folk. <laughs> these hillbillies. Yeah. Well, well I, I think I might be one of these IRL. I probably should have made the mascot that. <laughs> probably, yeah, but, you know, <laughs> close enough. Like, look, I, I work in a, in a, I work in a weaver facility, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of fucking hate it, so I probably wouldn't be as much a glass walk as I thought. West Virginia is not that far away. I actually like. I have family in West Virginia. I actually really like West Virginia. You, you can sing Richmond North, North of Richmond up there. Yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> so the hill folk are incredibly territorial. They shun the modern world. They're very uh, Kaczynskiite out there, um, and they basically fiercely defend their untouched territory. They hate the they hate the modern world and they want to return to monkey, even if that means fucking their cousins and making a lot of me, a lot of Midas, a lot of Metis. The book goes in. The book talks a lot about how because they live out in the middle of nowhere, there's a lot of inbred Garrow in the hill folk, um, and they're also well versed in fairy lore because of how close they are to the wild through a magical distilled beverage. Known as White Lightning, baby. The Hill Folk are <laughs> famous for their wild imbued spirit distilled beverage, White Lightning. It is so potent that not even the Fianna can shrug it off with Resist Toxin. They are that powerful. So they're inbred, but they are also fiercely territorial, very well versed in fairies, and they make damn fine booze. Uh, here, here comes a rant rant for a minute. Yes. So during my displeasure of talking to Rage Across the Internet, I told you that I have a bone to pick with Grant Kaysen. And part of that is that he says he hates Rage Across Appalachia, which I think is a fantastic book because, you know, I live in that fucking area, dude. And I got that, family that who lives of, there. I've been there. <laughs> yeah. And that, that book has a lot of correct information. And he hates it because he says there weren't enough... Uctena and Wendigo in the book. He says there were too many white people in Ridge Class App Appalachia. That's the dude's legit take. And I'm saying, have you fucking been to the Appalachians, dude? Have you seen West Virginia? 
Yeah. <laughs> I've been all through West Virginia, majority all the way to Ohio. Po- majority of the population there is it's white, but it's a different kind because these are people that are living in extreme poverty. If you think you're poor, these guys don't have cars, they don't have working televisions, they don't have smartphones. Sometimes it's just like the farm and your tractor is all you really have up there. And that's it. You got your You're house on the everything. side of the mountain. You walk to work at the store that's been there since 1968. And you've had the same clients for it's... 30 years. When I was driving up to you to do the, the Shellard episode, I drove through the Shenandoah and it blew my mind that towns were four city blocks. And that was it. Yeah. Yep. That's that, it. That, that, that's that's what classifies that's what classified as a town. That's what fucking Appalachia looks like. So yes, Rage Across Appalachia, as it is written, is not only fun as it is, but I would say it's essential reading. Because oh, yeah. if you want to have a game that's run in the South, check that book out. I'm dead ass serious with you. That book is great because it also talks about Farah living in that area. Yeah. Boom. Well, I have a changing breeds game. That's a perfect environment to do it in. I I would like to and... say uh, go ahead. There's still Native American reservations around that area, but the only tribe I really have spoken to has been the Lumbee. And even then, most of their modern-day members are biracial, where it's half Native American, half white. Namely because the Lumbee are beginning to realize that a lot of them are cousins. And in order to avoid inbreeding, they're saying we have to start um, mingling with white people now. Yeah, I mean, true? I've got yeah. a, uh, I, I actually used to work with a guy who was Native American, and he goes out to, he actually drives out there, like, four hours just to go, just to have actual powwows with his tribe. Like, his father is Native American, he's Native American, his mom's Native American. They all go out there as a family together. Um, he was a really genuine guy, I loved working with him. But I also like to say, just like, if you want to get like a better idea of what Appalachia really is, I'd highly recommend you follow the Twitter account, uh, Appalachian Aesthetics. And like, yeah, it's a lot of photography, but you can really tell a lot from the area just from, just from all the, just from all the sites out there. I remember I was driving out one time because my, me, my sister and a couple of friends rented a, uh, a house, uh, out in Virginia to stay there and play and play D and D out there for, for like a weekend. And while I was driving out there, it's like, I saw a lot of farms, a lot of hill, a lot of small towns like nestled in the Hills that were like a block wide. And a lot of, a lot of like old restaurants that were closed up and boarded up that looked like they were incredible at some point in time. That's they, that used to be like the spot back when coal mining was still the major industry in in that region, and there's a lot yeah. that 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 has sort of been lost there. It feels like it feels like a place lost to time. If one of my favorite uh, vacations when I was in Ap- in Appalachia, if you ask me where uh, one of my best trips, it was in Crowder's Mountain, in Appalachians. Yeah. Yeah, just spending some time there and learning about the history of that mountain. It was great. We have uh, one more camp to talk about. Yes, the swarm. The swarm are rat's teeth against the worm. They the, have the worm. What? The worm. Rat's teeth against the, the worm. worm. Uh, I I was just I was making a note that the swarm sounds like the worm. No, I no. Really think about it. No, the, the swarm. It, 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 Appropriate yeah. Gaffer's response. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandma's already picking up that, his axe that off two, the table. That, that one Pippin int. <laughs> Coming back. Uh, so they <laughs> heavily utilize pack, tac- pack tactics. Most Garrow would see this as dishonorable, but it absolutely works. They are ludicrously scary because of how well they serve Rat. Uh, if compromise fails at any point, call the swarm. They will take care of it. They carry out regular missions of sabotage and terrorism against their totem enemies, and their whole goal is to weaken the worm with a thousand bites and slashes. If you have a problem that cannot be reasoned with, call the swarm. They will take care of it. It's uh, <laughs> death by a thousand it's, cuts. Uh... 
these guys have a lot of guns. If you want to know how well armed America's gangs are, <laughs> just all, all the the wild armory. Um, Ryan, out of all these camps, which one did you like the most? Warm. <laughs> they get shit done. <laughs> get response. Yeah, yeah, they're very respectable, and that uh, shit. I don't think I ever got Chico's camp when we were talking about uh, werewolves. Oh, I don't think you ever did. It was um, it was Hill Folk. Was oh, Hill Folk. Gotcha. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all all the way down in the hills of Peru. Yes, like there's a lot of hills up there. Well, yeah, it's, there's uh, a whole mountain range that runs. Is that the the Andes Mountains? Yeah, yeah, the Andes. <laughs> Different culture, same people. Yep. Yeah. And the litany, we can just breeze by the litany. Uh, they say they're good rules, but we didn't write them. It's the same response as the Black Furies and the Wendigo, where they say they're good to go by, but if you break a law, don't stress it. They're more like guidelines. And to give Ryan something to do. Um, let's do gifts. Yes. The gifts. Uh, there is a ton of gifts they're crazy too <laughs> um, they really are they're like all shit posts yeah uh so i chose one from each uh there's five ranks um so the first one the first rank i chose kitchen chemistry <laughs> within with 10 minutes a bit of rage and everyday household chemicals you can unleash a firestorm of vengeance against the uncaring world you have a deep and instinctive understanding of the principles of modern chemistry. One of the one that allows you to scratch, build, and detonate explosives. This gift exists to cancel out the need for any sort of realistic, which is in quotations, explosive rules in the game. Rad spirits can teach this gift uh, occasionally with the help of a few furtive, yep, furtive, furtive. pranks on the internet. Uh, essentially, once a scene uh, with one range uh, and at least three household kitchen chemicals approved by the DM, or storyteller in this case, you can cause an explosion uh, inflicting an amount of aggravated damage equal to the character's permanent rage. Detonating <laughs> the explosives properly is the difficult part. So what we were talking about before with domestic terror... <laughs> yeah, that's fucking yeah. hysterical. Uh, so at the end of a scene in which the chemicals are, ca are cooked, uh, the character attempts an intelligence and science roll, difficulty six. With one success, with one success, the explosive will detonate at a specific time and date. Three successes allow them to be thrown. Dexterity and athletics distance equal to the Garo strength in yards or triggered by remote line of sight. Five successes allow for a complex trigger such as a timed matchbox fuse, tripwire, weight sensitive pressure, or a sound of a particular television personality. Uh, personality's voice. On a botch, of course, the bomb goes off in the Garo's face. That's hysterical. <laughs> I love that. It's literally just like a can of Febreze sitting in the kitchen and the guy's just sitting there watching TV and he's watching fucking, um, um, Oh, watching like Johnny Press Carson right. or something. Here's Johnny. <laughs> or, or the same scenario, can of breeze, but he's watching, uh, Johnny sins on his flat screen TV. <laughs> <laughs> it's the easiest uh, way to kill it, somebody. <laughs> Jesus, that's funny. This is what I mean by these gifts are ridiculous. <laughs> I I'm here for it. This is great. There's there's right. another good one. Um, it's kind of like well knowns, which is why I didn't bring it up. Uh, desperate strength, where it just like yeah. very quickly goes through that. Is that a rank uh, one? You burn a wall. Yeah. You burn a well power point. Yeah, it's rank one. You burn a wall power point. And then you um, roll one die of each health uh, that you have remaining. And for every success, you take an extra level of aggravated uh, damage in your attacks. So the lower your health, the more damage you deal. 
Mia. Which, which is, uh, according it's, to it's, Warpo, a it's also a mm-hmm. White Howler gift. Oh, yeah, White Howlers used to have this too. You yeah. Know, poor bastards. This yeah, is great. I'm afraid. There's a little bit of wor- a little bit of worm white hell in these guys. No wonder uh, they and the Fiona story. get along so well. Yeah, <laughs> really, we're going to talk about that later. Yep. Um, what's the next gift? So the uh, next one I chose from rank two was Who and Nanny. <laughs> hell Which... yeah! This is my favorite one. <laughs> uh, essentially, uh, Bonar Hill folk invented this gift. And they've been teaching it to gallards everywhere. A good old-fashioned hootenary involves music played. Oh, uh, played really fast and incredibly well. Uh, Dueling banjos is currently the most common song used. While Garo enacts this performance, every werewolf in his pack finds it easier to run, fight, jump, or perform any other rapid, strenuous physical activity. Uh, unfortunately, everyone who hears the performance feels like dancing. They might stomp their feet, clap to the music, and even dance around it if the music's good enough. This gives the pack a decided edge in combat. With this gift, a pack of hill folk and a galliard with a banjo can tear up a whole room of famori and black spirals with one hell of a square dance. Uh, the description is just amazing, by the way. Yes. <laughs> this gift is taught by an ancestor spirit, usually the one that looks uh, looks and acts like a galliard. Some galliards claim this gift is taught by Ghost of Elvis, <laughs> but no one believes them. <laughs> <laughs> that is hysterical. To- oh my god, I love this clan now. I, 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 I can explain more about the Elvis part in a minute. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, Thank you very much. When the Hootenary starts, the Garo is using, uh, the Garo using it spends a gnosis. Uh, they roll a manipulation and performance and plays fast paced route cautious. Hold on. <laughs> Let's go find out how to pronounce this word because I failed English in high school. Uh, which, which word? Raucous. There we go. Raucous. A, rock- a, a, a ruckus. Raucous music on a musical instrument. If the character scores three successes on the first turn, the gift is activated. If he doesn't, he can continue to attempt the roll each turn until he does. For the duration of one scene, as long as he continues to perform, each Garrow in his pack can add three extra dice to any dexterity and brawl or athletics dice pool. A pack mate can add these dice to only one action each round, or he may divide them among multiple actions. He cannot use more than three bonus dice from this gift in a turn. Any enemies listening should make a willpower roll when this, uh, while this power is activated. If an opponent hearing the music can't score at least three successes on this roll, raise the difficulty of all his dexterity and brawl or athletic dice by two. Melee and firearm pools are not affected by this gift. <laughs> that is so fucking it's, tight, dude. It's a buff and a debuff at the same time, and it's only a rank this, two. This is a not very just, great way to disrupt combat. Right? Yeah. Not just that, you also get to play a banjo really fast. Like, you're like I'm, fucking deliverance. You, just saying. You um, probably, probably, probably get an accordion too and just like play a polka really fast. Oh, yeah, saying, too. Chico could take this, and you guys can see Dan, uh, Grim dance for the first time. Yeah, yeah, no, please, that, please. I also decided to go over gifts to look at what I could get for Chico, and there's definitely going to be some, uh, some of this <laughs> shenanigan added to it. Man, I'm here for it. I'll bring the beer. And uh, right. think about we're we currently ended our game outside of a rock band. So, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a ballroom blitz. Gift. It's a perfect chance gift. to get an accordion or some sort of musical instrument. I got a spare guitar, dude. Get... You can have one. Fuck yeah. Just don't kill my dad, please. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I know he's a leech, but come on. He's my dad. 
He deserved it. He's a terrorist. Hold up a second. We didn't actually blow or, or cause that. We stopped, or we tried stopping it. Yes. If you just left the Ministry Church alone, it wouldn't have uh, happened. No, no it, it would have happened regardless. Yeah, probably would have. Because <laughs> uh, Malakath was coming. That's true as well. Anyway, uh, let, me take a, yeah. let, me take a, let me take a guess. Is it dumpster diving? Uh, for the third rank? Yeah. Uh, no, I chose uh, Laugh of the Hyena. Oh, okay. I was Ooh. thinking about dumpster diving, but I'll, uh, it was like a tie between Laugh of the Hyena and Cooter's Revenge. <laughs> yeah, Cooter's <laughs> Revenge is another one where it's... <laughs> Uh, so I chose uh, laugh. I mean, I can cover the other two if you if you want me to. Uh, no, 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 just go over to one. All right. Uh, then I will change it to dumpster dive. Grab that real quick. All right. Dumpster diving. One of the less sanitary tri tribal totems, the Great Trash Heap, has dissipated into conscious thought. Uh, consciousness throughout the dumping grounds, landfills, and trash piles of the world. Bonars who follow this totem commune with the Incarna yep. by defending, protecting, yep. and even obeying these fetish, festering right. heaps. Yep. I don't know why I said fetish. Uh, when a Garrow has reached this rank of renown, he may be called upon to travel between festering sacred, uh, festering sacred saints to carry out the totem's demands. Just as entering a moon bridge helps Garrow travel between Cairns, dumpster diving allows Bonars to uh, and their packs to venture from one shine of the great trash heap to another. The werewolf burrows down into the trash, tunnels around in it, and then resur uh, resurfaces inside of another heap on another part of the planet. Obviously, this gift is taught by a totem spirit of the great trash heap, a Garou temporarily serving the totem through the level one gift tagalong can learn this gift, but the werewolf must still petition the totem each time he uses it. That's kind of cool. Yeah, that is pretty neat. You get a secondary moon bridge. Yeah. See, but I'll hold, it's a very easy way to get out of trouble. <laughs> yeah. This. Yeah. Nice. Now is it? Can that be used for the pack? Yes, Millie bonars Gundam. and their Millie packs. Yeah. That's kind of fucking him. tight. I behold, uh, immediately escape pursuing Fomori tribe. <laughs> yeah, just everybody, <laughs> quick, jump into this dumpster to hide, and then we wake up. We're back in Coney Island. The totem decides when to open and close these gateways and assign their destinations. When the pack goes dumpster diving, the highest ranking bone arm makes the Gnosis roll, difficulty 4, when entering the trash pile. The travel time is the same as for stepping sideways. The ability cannot be used more than once per day, and it only works at the totem's behest. Keeping these pathways open is difficult, so the traveler and his pack must return to the original site within three days. If they don't make it back in time, they'll have to travel back by more conventional means. This also works as, um, if you're sick of your current chronicle, uh, if you guys want to stop playing Rage Across New York, you can just dive into this dumpster, and now we're playing Rage Across Miami. Yep. Cool. Yep, wonderful. <laughs> Now we start getting to the broken ones. These are more practical, but very dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the one I chose was Shadow of the Rat. Mm. <laughs> which is a rank 4 Bonar's gift. Our rats are known for their resilience, persistence, and ruthlessness. Since the rat serves as the Bonar's tribal totem, Garu of this tribe may learn a great deal about survival under the tutelage of the rat spirits. The Garrow can spend one Gnosis to lower the difficulty of all stamina, stamina rolls, including Sulk rolls, by one for the duration of the scene. Now, that's not a lot, but that, that is going to pay off. Like what you're saying, Ryan, that's going to pay off when you oh, use yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Considering that 
how how dangerous that Samsa fight was that we had last session. I was not expecting and... it to hurt that bad. I almost fucking yeah, died the, the, again. You're, you're getting punched by a giant cockroach. These guys are strong as hell. Yeah, and think that through. <laughs> so, but that, it's not much, but it pays off in a very practical sense. It's a lot like, it, it, you know, it's a lot like just willpower in general. Just one extra, re one extra roll, one level of difficulty can be the difference between life and death. Yeah. Mm. Because that one was short, I'll go over another short one from rank four, which is blink. The bonar can duck into a shaded area, or an open dumpster, or a, da or a dark alley, or beneath a parked car, and pop out in another shaded area some distance away. Uh, obviously, a rat spirit teaches this gift as much as the actual gifts in this list. Mm. Uh the player spends one gnosis point and rolls manipulation and stealth difficulty six. The character can reappear in any shaded area within number of uh, successes times 20 yards, which is uh, 18 meters per success. So if you have six which is essentially... successes, you can do it 120 yards. That's pretty uh, fucking that tight. That is the, the shadow step from the monk, the shadow monk in D&D. &D. Yeah. Since you can do that. Isn't doesn't and, um uh not Protean but uh or hundred eight meters. What's the other vampire discipline that has this? Uh celerity is what you're thinking. Yeah, of. celerity has blink, doesn't it? Yeah, it's uh it does involve shade though. A vampire can just use blink for any distance they want. It's still Cel pretty nice. Celerity is a, celerity is a very strong power, but you get a little taste of it with this. And uh, there's one I, crazy one, rank five, Ryan. <laughs> uh, is it the one I'm, the one I chose? Uh, start reading it. Start reading it. Survivor. Yeah. I might have not chosen. Oh, it, it is. <clears throat> Give me one. Second. Sorry, I'm not used to talking this much. Uh, the it's gift confers temporary immunity to many environmental factors. The Garu has no need for food, water, or sleep, and she does not suffer from temperature extremes. She is also immune to natural diseases and poisons. Warm toxins will still affect her, but a half of their normal potency system. The player spends one gnosis and rolls stamina and survival, difficulty seven. The effect lasts for one day per success. Uh, by spending a second gnosis point, the Bonor can gain three extra points of stamina, and he suffers no wound penalties, uh, penalties, but the gift will expire prematurely after 10 rounds of full combat. The girl must sleep for at least eight hours when the gift wears off and he awakens ravenously hungry. That sounds fucking incredible. Yeah, yeah. it's definitely worth the, uh, the, the penalties are definitely worth it. Uh, leave that all those penalties we noticed that we went from very silly gifts that had very practical purposes to just gifts with practical purposes yeah. there is no there is no bad gift with the bonars yeah there are, and i was thinking the children of gaia were stacked but no the bonars are fucking busted dude it's that they have, they have the, a gift called riot as a rank five which which <laughs> which does exactly what you think it does that's yeah fucking yeah. awesome <laughs> And uh, briefly talk about fetishes. We typically don't talk about these on the channel, but these are so extreme that we gotta mention a few, like Susie's Dollar, which is a a dollar bill that can become any value of dollars between one and a hundred dollars in value. That upon being spent, a little bit of time passes, and then that money immediately returns to your pocket. So it's like check bouncing with money. Alternatively, you can take a, a pocket that has six coins in it that infinitely regenerate as long as there is at least one coin in your pocket that you put the fetish into. And on top of that, there are two different radios. One of them is a spirit radio, which automatically picks up on... It gives you like a weather forecast of what's going on in the Umbra. And then there's also the Umbral CB, 
which allows communication between the material plane and the umbra in the form of a radio. Oh, that's pretty nice. It's like the Silent Hill yeah. radio. Yeah, exactly that. You're able to talk to people between the two. You're copying the Void Engineers with what you're doing with the CP radio. That The Void Engineers with the Tenocracy have something like that. Behold, you can make it with the fetish. Neat. And now you, now you too could be a spaceman. Are you saying we can There's be a also, rocket man? Yeah. I'm also noticing... Ham, I think Ivan Smolotov, I think you were supposed to retrieve those bottles after throwing those. I think so, yes. Yeah, because those bottles don't break. You yeah, have uh, one of those still. Yeah, uh, I will. Yeah. But we also can get you the whole gym bag. Oh, yes. the Essentially the bag of holding. Or is that the one that melds into your skin when you transform? Yeah, th this is the bag of holding that melds into you when you transform. Behold, out of all groups to get a bag of holding, this is the trap that gets it. It's yep. still useful. Yeah. And it's it's not a fetish, but something funny. They have a little ability, uh, subway surfing. Uh, need to go across town in a hurry? Catch a lift, or better, catch a subway train. And there's rules on how to jump on top of a moving subway and ride across it. <laughs> While keeping the veil intact. <laughs> Fucking Chico using playing Subway Surfer. Yes. <laughs> Just don't touch the, yellow, the the third rail. Don't pee on it either. Yeah. And now we can go into relationships. All right. So they have a lot to say about a lot of different people. Uh, some less than Not others. As much as the some more than others. Not as much as Charlie Guy do. Oh goodness, no. <laughs> They still do a lot of talking. So, start us off with the Black Furies. So, they're kind of mixed on the Black Furies. So, they don't take no shit from nobody. They will fuck anybody up. However, they just don't like men all that much. They just hate half of all the human race. And to some people, it is what it is. To other people, specifically Oscar Spitzfar, great name, uh, he thinks they're uppity women who all they do is bitch. So they're they don't they're they're good fighters. They just don't like men all that much and they do complain a lot. That's their official just What's up? Put a muzzle on them and then they'll be fine. A little bit. A little bit. Um <laughs> So uh after them we have the children of Gaia. Gaians seem to really understand the uh Bonars. They're always looking out for them. They're always trying to help the poor folk, and the and they're very valuable allies for that reason. However, they don't feel like their their merciful ways has any place in the battlefield. The Garrow are at war with the Worm at all times, so Mercy doesn't really have a place for them there. But even still, they are thankful for the help that they do occasionally provide. Um, it's, yeah. They also say we'd rather have help instead of pity. Where uh, that's the same response as the Wendigo is that the, ch the children of Gaia can uh, cry for you all they want, but they need to contribute to something. Exactly. Uh, moving mm. on from them, uh, I'm gonna, I kind of want to read this uh, verbatim just because I really like it. It really helps exemplify the why they're yes, the Fiana, why they like the Fiana so much. Uh, second to helping, uh, who is a fat <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> A rotund Ragavash Epicure. Uh, probably at a Fiona pub when he's saying this. You think all these guys do is drink and fight? That's a mistake. You believe that lie, then the Fiona are almost as misunderstood as we are. Believe me, they suffered almost as much as we have. In fact, there was a time in America when the Fiona weren't considered much better than the Bodnars. Of course... They managed to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. As for us, well, most of the folks in my pack don't even got boots. So they really sort of like them because they're they're somewhat as misunderstood as themselves, but they always have to admire their resilience. No, they're not the survivalists that the Bonars are, but they always pick themselves up when they get knocked down. And I, <laughs> I love that kinship between them. It's, it's really sweet. These two really do love each other. The, um, 
the Fianna really have made the Bonars the replacement for the White Howlers. Yeah, they're they're they've uh, made good friends with the with the with the Fianas. The Bonars have. Yeah, yeah. You said in the in the Fianna episode, they, these guys don't need to get up for work tomorrow. So behold, party away. Yeah, it's great. Uh, moving on from them, the Get Ephemeris, featuring my favorite name for a Ragabash thief, not here. Uh, so the Fenrir are really good at fighting, but they treat them like shit. However, they treat you less like shit if you kiss up to them a little bit. And we gotta respect how great their warriors and their place is in front of us while we hide in the back. Well, the Gaffiners do that to every, everybody. The Gaffiners are mean. They're, they're heroic, but they're mean. Yeah, it's like, yeah, you're strong and you're good at killing shit, but can you fucking dial it back a little bit? <laughs> I don't know what you guys are talking about. We're great. <laughs> 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 oh, that's great. Okay. Except um, it's my drive. Yes, the glass walkers. So uh, they don't like the glass walkers, and we we talked nope. about why. So there was a chance of the twenties for the two of them to become a single tribe. Of course, Rat and Cockroach both being giant assholes nipped that in the bud. Uh, especially as the glass walkers were palling around with the Giovanni, and people have said that the Bonars should be the glass walkers' lackeys. And they aren't going to be lackeys to people that won't properly respect their elders. But it is occasionally nice to have real money and warm food and to scam the shit out of those rich bastards for everything they have. And it's like, as the book says, they it's like the glass walkers think they're scamming us, but they're scamming them right back. Just wait and see. So it's like... Again, I'm seeing the fingerprints of cyberpunk in this game. <laughs> yes, I really like it. Um... Moving on from them, we got the Red Talons. Uh, what the fuck are ha what the fuck's wrong with these guys? Do they think that <laughs> destroying humanity is a betrayal of Mother Gaia because you know Garrow are supposed to be born from half wolf, half man. Saving wolves is cool is cool and good, but you don't gotta kill everybody. And forests kind of suck. That was that, that was that was in the book. Raven Can Kicker, the Lupus Street Rat says, "I'm sick of forests. Lupus are dumb to stay in forests. Forests suck." Time to move to the city. Eh? Hamids pretend to be wolves. We can live as humans. Nothing more to say. Eh? Is that South Park episode where we're talking about how much the Amazon sucks and <laughs> did not give your money to the Amazon? <laughs> Wheat sucks. It's, uh, it's uh, the the red talons don't have. They honestly don't feel the same way about the bonars because they they would like the bonars if they would just stop living in the city. So it's um, if you two would just meet a compromise already, you could be best friends. Nah, nah. Well, I mean, they have the hill folk. You have the hill folk. Yeah, yeah. You can get along with them, but um, the the rat finks, absolutely not. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, on from them, we got the uh, Shadow Lords. Once again, uh, another mutually manipulative re relationship. Basically, they feed the Shadow Lords information that they find out, but only if the Shadow Lords are willing to talk secrets back to them. They're good temporary allies for undermining bad leadership, but don't count on them for anything else. Just like, you know, we're we're not stupid. We know you we know you undermine people. That's your whole thing. Just make them a temporary ally and then get rid of them when they're done. And thanks to our alliance with the Nesaratu, they probably know they're already working with the Camarilla. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh moving on from them, our favorite our favorite boyos, the Silver Fangs. Fuck these guys. So basically the book says uh, talk to these guys like you're talking to an asshole. Yes, sir. No, sir. Understood, sir. Whatever you say, sir. Uh, knowing being a Garrow is a part of knowing your place, and it's not really your your place to comment on theirs. Just smile and nod, and then go fuck off and do whatever you like. Maybe do a little bit of rebellion as a treat, because you know they're all fucking senile old bastards. So that that's basically exactly. what they got to say about them. 
like working in a job where I really don't like the corporate at my job. Yep. I can fully relate to this because holy shit, what you guys are so obsessed with wasting money on shit that doesn't matter. I mean, and I, of course, uh, I've done this at, at, at a couple of different jobs myself. Like, you know, the SOP is a guideline. It mm. always is. So is OSHA, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, yep. oh, safety first, <laughs> my guy. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to wear my PPE. It gets in the way of productivity. Exactly. It's like we you don't want to wear the productivity. I don't. What? Fucking losing an arm. <laughs> That's true. But look, I don't want to wear my apron because then customers stop and talk to me when I'm trying to unload this truck. Okay. They uh, turn their head around the aisle and they look at you with that big saucer eyes and say, "Do you work here?" And I have to say, oh, yes, I do. And I got to stop what I'm doing. And then it's a three minute adventure that I don't want to go on. <laughs> See, this is why I always find the nearest employee and just drop them on them. Like, hey, this is my job. It's your fucking job. Do your fucking job. If you did uh, your to- job, I wouldn't be in this situation in the first place, making your life miserable. <laughs> yeah, I called on the sales associate. Uh, the Sun Striders. Oh, yeah, Sun Striders. Forgot to fucking talk about the sun starters. How did I do that? Well, well, it's They're... Pretty, well, it's pretty easy. Is that they they want to like them, but the feud between rat and owl makes that impossible. Exactly. It's like they're very useful when you're traveling. They have great stories, but they don't like to take their time on the road. And the ghosts are kind of creepy. And owl and rat hate each other. And they always run away from a fight. So you know they're kind of shifty. But they're kind of useful, but we can't really work together. It, it's basically like, um, I'd love to be friends with you, but my dad said we can't. <laughs> That's basically them of the Silent Striders. Uh, the Yuktena. Uh So mm. the Yuktena, they think the Yuktena are going a little too close to the worm for their liking with all the mysteries and shit that they're on about. They never know what they know, therefore they don't trust them. Like they don't they don't like to share the secrets they got. And as we discussed, the the Bonars are all about finding out what they shouldn't know about. They're really good you at that. Know, it's it's not like the Tenor are trying to start a race war across the country and eventually resulting in a genocide against all white people to get revenge for the loss of the Pure Lands. It's yep. not like that's their plan or anything. And although the Bonars relent that they may not be all that different if they would actually open up to them. They've both suffered quite a bit throughout their history. And sometimes you got to stick up for the Yuktena. Like, they're they're kind of like the misunderstood cousins, but they wish they'd, ta- they'd open up a little more. Um, After all, because we, we talked a little about, about the Civil War. You free the slaves, slaves don't, still don't have jobs. Um, the Tenna really enjoyed talking to Black America. Your kinfolk tend to overlap with the two. Yep. Uh, the Wendigo, the description for the Wendigo, because red blood Get is over it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, you would say, you would say. There's a fucking fly in my room. God damn it. Anyway, uh, yeah, he's basically just like, stop bitching. You live in fucking Canada with socialized health care and gun control. Come, it's like you, if he, it's basically he basically says if you don't like it, leave. We're saying we're filming this episode the day after Justin Trudeau and and Zelensky had a standing ovation for a former SS officer. Oh yeah, that's true. That did fucking happen today. Yeah, yeah so that was um, that's some weird fucking news, my guy. Like Bonars, you're right, but you're wrong. But you're right, but you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. The the opinion of the Wendigo from the Bonar's perspective is kind of fucky, but this is coming from an Arun warrior for the American dream. So exactly, <laughs> like Red Blood is you basically the, a MAGA American. You picked the wrong guy to talk about this. Tribe. Yes, you did. <laughs> it's really fucking funny, though. I can't deny that. And, Oh then my have god! The stargazers. If I if I could take the lead in the stargazers, go ahead, go ahead. They say that the stargazers walked out of the Garu Nation because leadership abandoned them. Where of course you say that because you hate the Surafangs. 
But really, as we talked about, the Stargazers left the nation first because they just stopped contributing. I mean, yeah, you have the Kuei Jin to worry about, and the Kuei Jin were hell of a, a hell of a force, but at no point did you think maybe we should call some help with the Kuei Jin, and maybe we should contribute to other operations and get some help over on our side. So the Stargazers, in their own arrogance, that's the reason they're not part of the nation anymore. Yeah, so, and then um, they gave up. They were like, nah, we got yeah. this. And then, like, why is nobody helping us? Fuck you guys, we're leaving. If the Stargazers were still a part of the nation, I would say they would get along great with the Bonars. Oh, yeah. Especially, yeah, especially since yeah. they're all, like, since they're all Tibetan monks, basically. Yeah, and given that in first edition, they don't have anything bad to say about the Stargazers either. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, so um, moving on to the other things, and I'm trying to get this fucking fly that's flying around my room. Sorry, vampires. Yes, vampires. Uh, short. Uh, the short of it is, don't trust them ever. Like they'll they'll fuck you up. So some of them always try to like go back, and some of them try to live like they're still alive, and then they fuck it up terribly because they're vampires. Some of them. Manage to work with the Garo, but then they always go back on the promise when it no longer suits them. Because leeches only survive by putting their survival before everything else. By trusting a vampire, you're putting all of the people you care about in jeopardy. But the Nosferatu are useful and keep it on the down low. We have a source book called Dark Alliance Vancouver that shows exactly why you don't do this. Eh? Uh, guess, I guess why, um, werewolves and vampires team up in, in Vancouver, Ventru do what they do best, screw over the deal, and it ends in a massacre. That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. that sounds very Ventru. This, uh, this, the Ventru, you, you can't trust the Ventru, dude, the, f but your alternative is the La Sombra, so, um. Neither are good. <laughs> okay, so moving on from that, we have mages. Their magic appears to draw upon defiance of Gaia's creation in stark contrast to how the werewolf procure gifts and rights. They subjugate the spirit world to their own ends, and the world will eventually take vengeance on them for, you know, because of it. However, they, there is a lot you can learn from talking to mages. Like, they're, while they aren't perfect, they are incredible at improvising. Like, as the, as the book says, you know, that's what street magic is all about, making the best of what you have. You don't have pure spring water, you bless a little Pepsi. You don't have a willow branch, you find a car antenna. Maybe their style's a little dangerous, they draw upon too much power sometimes, but there's not really as much weaver in them. A little, little dangerous? Yeah, a little bit. Blessing, no, blessing little Pepsi bit. is no. not the same as blessing water, my guy. Cut. Kyle, but it's Pepsi. Kyle. <laughs> what? Kyle. These guys are describing the hollow men. <laughs> and? Those are the postmodern mages that tend to make magic that goes disastrously wrong. But it's Pepsi. <laughs> it's the hollow ones. You don't trust these guys. The hollow ones make crystal Pepsi, though. <laughs> It's gonna blow up in your face. <laughs> yeah, this that is not a good idea. <laughs> no, we're gonna be fine, bro. Give me that can of Pepsi. It'll be, yeah, fine. We're gonna be fine. We're not we're not gonna dirty bomb the New York streets with this. <laughs> fine, we'll use A and W instead. <laughs> okay. Now what what strikes me? Is that these guys are more afraid of hunters than they are vampires? Oh yeah, they're they're terrified of hunters. So the hunters, uh, I mean, basically it boils down to somehow these random humans can see through werewolves and resist delirium. Play it safe around them. Don't hunt hunters. They will fuck your shit up. Is basically what's going on with them. They're scared of the hunters. Given the Inquisition, they have every reason to. Yes, All the exactly. memories of that. Uh, and then we have ghosts. Something prevented them from passing on, and they exist in the Dark Umbra, which is the realm of death. 
the rituals have no effect on them, and if you see them, shred them apart. They're they're scary. We don't like them. It and... also doesn't help that a lot of the places they move into tend to be haunted. Yep. There's um there's a story in first edition where a bonar finds a, a teddy bear and smells it, says it smells nice, and wanna throw it into a fire and keep myself warm with it. And then they're haunted by a ghost of a little girl for three nights after doing that. Oh, that's fucked. Yeah, so um, these two tend to intersect way more than you would think they would. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it says, like, because of where they sleep sometimes, if, like, you fall asleep in a graveyard, you're going to get haunted. Mm-hmm. So, you go out, you yeah, go have, that's, uh, that's how it works. Yep. You go out have the damn... Uh, Oh, who were the the Keening where the Shanters? Uh they get their their power from causing you to have nightmares and night terrors. So uh <laughs> um yeah, sleep fun. tight, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's gonna be great. Uh the Fae. Uh they don't like the Fae. They they say there's no place for fairies in this world, and the only ones that are left are pale imitations, and if they're not extinct, they're about to be. Like, the Fianna sugarcoat them, but, like, nah, fuck it. They ignore the blight of the world, and it's going to eventually kill them. What? Well, that's pretty short-sighted, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit. Like, oh, don't talk shit about my mate, Don Drake, fucking Don Grand Slam. That's my best mate there. These guys, are, these guys are the best. They're trying to make people happy, and yet you say, oh, fuck them, let them die. Bro, you're trying to make people happy, too. Y'all should fucking work together. Yeah. Uh, now for this one, we're going to speed through Pharah because yep. we've been going on for... Yeah, we're going to speed run the Pharah. So the Ajaba used to be all over Africa, but they never found any. Uh, the Anasi, uh, they're fucking creepy because daylight doesn't slow them down. They're fucking all weaver aligned and they band together and bite stuff whenever threatened. They're scary. Don't like them. The Bastet, secret, mystical. Don't see them a lot. Corax, they never shut the fuck up. They gossip. Well, they talk a lot of shit. Uh, they take the prey for. They take the eyes of the prey and then bolt. Uh, they might actually be kind of smart. Uh, the Gural. They They taught them resist pain. They don't like the Bonars because of the Impergium, I guess. Uh, they're great healers and even better killers. Uh, the Macole. They spend a lot of time on their two legs and they tell great fucking stories and they smoke a lot of pot. Uh, the Noesha, trickster sons of bitches. The bros are just crazy. Ratkin, uh, great friends are terrible enemies. They lost all their sense of restraint, and they love the wild too much. And the Rokea, they heard about them. Evidently, they attacked an oil rig near the Great Barrier Reef. They got a lot of fucking work to do because they're only fair in the sea. That's it. <laughs> now the Ratkin. Uh, Ham, I was pushing you to take a, a fee of... <laughs> a merit while we were doing character creation oh um, which one it's the three point merit that makes you friends with the ratkin I thought about taking that that honestly would have been lethally if, useful if you take that gift you have a pack of rats size determinant by the storyteller following you for the entire game oh my god I don't that think is... they'll be privy to let us into many cairns like that <laughs> And while they're following you, you'll look over your shoulder, you'll see, you will see one of them pop their head out, and then they will immediately duck back away, and then you'll try looking for them, you can't find them. And then you start moving again, and then the nine or ten rats following you start moving again. That's kind of funny, though. <laughs> I love that. That is... It's so cartoonish, it's great. <laughs> And if you if you take Ratten as your, as your totem, uh, behold, your, the size of your pack now tripled. Jesus. And of course, we know the Ratkin are very dangerous fighters. <laughs> That'd be very useful against against Ruslan. And given how many, given how much rats breed, you want to talk about rabbits breeding? No, rats breeding with the sheer number of Ratkin in existence. Uh, <laughs> at any point, the rats are ready to rise up and take back the world. Uh, the Bonars, when they survive the a post-apocalypse, are going to look around and find out for every one Bonar, there's ten Ratkin that survived with them. 
The sun never sets on the rat empire. The rats will eventually win. We'll just uh, basically, <laughs> like, if Gehenna happens in this game, we're just going to play an all, skaz- an all Skaven Warhammer 40k game after this. <laughs> like, we're playing all that. the Skaven race, or we're playing against the Skaven? We're just all playing Skaven. Ah. Uh, rat only. Boat, no, no. Man, uh, thing, thing. thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then Deadass did add the, the rare rats because I'm pretty sure like one of the authors said, yeah, we're reading D and D in 40k and we sell hey uh rare rats. Oh, let's put that in the game. They're like, wow, rats seem to be really popular for some reason. We should have some. The rat people. They are weirdly popular. Like Yeah. If you, need, if you just need an enemy, put a rat in the game. And now we get to talk about totems. <clears throat> yes, totem time. All right, so let's begin with Great Trash Sheep, actually, just because I have the picture for her saved already. All right. All right, so here she is. <laughs> In meme chat. Hold the fuck up. What? Fraggle Rock. <laughs> Bro, oh, yeah, it's straight up Fraggle Rock. God they damn it. They got the idea from Fraggle Rock when making this totem. Like, one of them was watching Fraggle Rock on TV and said, let's put this in the game. That is hysterical. I mean, after all, after all, you see, she's already got two little rat groupies with her. Yeah, look at her. Look at her go. Yeah. So the Great Trash Sheep, I grossly underestimated how powerful this totem is. Because it will frequently summon itself as an in in um, Incarna. So it can come into battle with you out of any pile of garbage in the world, which it can see through, meaning that it is omniscient. If you have a trash can in your house, Great Trash Sheep knows what you're doing. Well, she's in a drawer, so... Yeah, so let that, let that sink in. She can hear everything you're doing. <laughs> It's like Santa so, Claus is watching, but she's made out of trash. So behold, world's greatest information network, the Great Trash Heap and her jagglings. And of of course, Great Trash Heap is pretty much like the character you're seeing up here, Marjorie the Great Trash Heap from Fraggle Rock. She's pretty nice. Talk to the Great Trash Heap sometimes. <laughs> of course, she wants you to dump responsibly. Don't just jump, dump your trash wherever. And first edition was really weird because apparently just following her in first edition would automatically crank up your, um, if I'm trying to figure out this right, because the rules are, the rules are a little wonky. It would automatically give you a permanent wisdom score of 10. Uh, what? Right. Be- because great trash sheep is omniscient and knows all this information. That is so busted. What? Absolutely is. That is broken as shit. What the hell? Bo- so for second edition, they decided we're going to, we're going down that back by a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll right. Say. So. Uh, oh, what the fuck? that is. Uh, all right, background cost four. By the way, so <clears throat> once each cycle of the moon, the all-seeing, all-knowing trash sheep will answer one question posed by the pack. The rest of the month, if each pack member carries a chunk of garbage offered by the heap, they can always communicate with their totem. Uh, tin cans, just having a, a bag of tin cans in your in your backpack. Um, that's the easiest way to do this. As an added bonus, the pack receives two enigmas and two investigations, and the trash sheep's followers are good at finding enough information if they dig enough. The ban... At each full moon, the pack must declare one great trash sheep as their home. They must then protect it and carry out the request of the tome spirit within it. You must live in a pile of garbage once every 30 days. <laughs> so you literally just have to cosplay Oscar the Grouch once a month. Yes. Just find the nearest landfill and live in it. 
and that's what you do for a day. Reminds me of that meme where like somebody where like Sesame Street like posted an announcement as like Sesame Street introduces the first homeless character. The first comment was Oscar the Grouch been living in a trash can for thirty years. <laughs> he always exists. <laughs> Uh, next up is Raps. Let's use the picture of him that we made for uh, for 3.5. Yep. Let me pull it up for you. Uh, uh, so me and Sean made all these pictures yesterday. Um, we're using Mid Journey because we saw no issue in doing that. All right. Uh, uh, I know a lot of artists want to get butt hurt about saying, oh, it's taking our um, business away from real artists. Well, if you didn't charge $60 for a black and white image, I would have paid you money. Yeah, we're we're right, so here he is. We're doing this. We're doing this fucking as DIY as possible. This this is all money out of my pocket too. I'm not going to start a Patreon. I'm not taking ad revenue. I'm not doing a Kickstarter. Yeah, he he does look because, creepy looking in this, doesn't he? Yeah, rat. He has two faces, by the way. Does he? Because uh, so very similar to Stag and very similar to Unicorn. Rat had to split a piece of himself off because he realized he wasn't being violent enough. <laughs> it's like wow maybe if there's two of me we can kill more things so rat god is the main aspect of rat where he is a god of war who says fight with using every underhanded tactic you think of just kill i don't care about honorable fighting i don't care how you do it just kill all of my enemies that's Rat God. And then compare that to Mother Rat, who is the nice portion of Rat that he pulled out of his body, who is female, and is the one who's actually caring for the nation, as making sure all the kids are being fed, all the menace are growing up with education, everyone has a an article of clothing. And that's the nice Rat. So you have good Rat, bad Rat with Rat. She presents Dobby with drawing. socks. Yeah, he's a very fun totem. <laughs> yeah. So, reading to you what Rat does. Would you like to guess how much he costs? Uh, I mean, $800. I have... <laughs> $22. Uh, no, seven 20... doll hairs. Oh, yeah, there you go. Doll... It costs the hair of a Bobby doll for me to take this rat. All right. Background cost five. Individually, see a great big pop up came up on the screen. Sorry about that. Rat children subtract one difficulty from all bite rolls. Uh, okay. And all difficulty, all difficulties involving stealth or quiet are also reduced by one. As we know, the bite is a very consistent attack to land in this game, so that's great. Uh, as a pack, you can call upon five points of wallpaper per story. And if you follow them, Bone Hours and Ratkin will help you. That's... The pen, yeah. kill no vermin of any kind. That's a little difficult. Yeah. yeah. Uh, make sure you don't step on that bug. It's like uh, it's it's like that episode of fucking The Simpsons where he, Homer travels back in time and can't touch anything. Well, I'll think about I'll, I'll think about the Scream Pillar. The which one? <laughs> the the Scream Pillar. What the, the fuck? The is... Screaming Caterpillar in his backyard that he's not allowed to kill because the nature car conservationist is looking at him the entire time. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, given how much. Bonar and Glassworker communications have broken down. The rats are probably eating the other vermin. So it's probably more along the lines of don't kill them. I want to have the kill for myself. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, next up, the funny one. General Lee. Hell yeah, buddy. <laughs> the car from Dukes of Hazard is a totem in this game. <laughs> that is fucking tight, dude. I'm not, I'm not shitting you. I'm looking at D and I'm, I'm looking at the Bonars tribe book. This is page eighty five. You can pull up the General Lee. Yeah, it's like also the Cooter's Revenge is also a Duke's oh, Hazard yeah. reference. <laughs> yeah, it is. Ah, oh, it's great. We, now you may be wondering why is this a totem? It's because the the Bonars love the show. 
That's why. <laughs> they also love Elvis Presley. Um, they say because Elvis Presley came from the sticks and became a self-made music man, that they that's the reason they love Elvis so much. Elvis is not a totem, though. Oh, that's a damn shame. We should put that in 3.5. Elvis is a totem would be fucking sick. In, in, in an expansion book, Elvis is a totem. <laughs> You know what? If, if I run a if I run a werewolf game at any point, I'm gonna make Elvis Presley a totem. <laughs> you gonna have nothing but Elvis music in the background. Yes. You loved Fallout New Vegas, and you loved me and the King. Yes. Look, the band is going to be you have to you have to sing at least one song a day. Yeah. There you go. He ended up dying like he did in Forrest Gump. He sang too many songs. Exactly. The General Lee background cost five. Okay, here this is this is wild, dude. Once accepted by the general, everyone in the pack gets two dots of drive and two dots of craft. Uh, this would be repair in old editions. Mm -hmm. All pack members have their difficulty of drive rolls reduced by two, and the pack alpha will gain in um, intuitive knowledge. Of all of America's highways, including the back roads of the Deep South. The ban. Worshippers of General endlessly tinker with their cars. As part of this, at least one member of the pack must have mechanics tools ready at all times. There's a good reason for this. The pack totem spirit lives in a car that they care for. You buy a jalopy, and then you repair that car every day until it gets to General Lee possession material, and then the General possesses that car. And each day, a pack member must spend at least an hour doing repairs, improvements, and modifications to the shrine, which is also the car. If the pack skips a day, the car begins to degrade, taking one temporary fault each day until someone repairs it. You need to do a wits and repair roll difficulty 6 to fix it. And... <laughs> the general also encourages you to do as many stunts while driving him as possible <laughs> oh dude I want to run fucking rage across Appalachia so bad now and just have this as a pickup truck <laughs> yes just an orange pickup truck with a fucking Maduce in the back that'd be awesome the be great. The black trans Sam from Smoking the Bandit. Yes. <laughs> if you're a car freak, you're gonna love this totem. <laughs> oh my god, dude! Yeah, that it, with with fucking Elvis as a totem, Captain Spaulding and the General Lee. I think that'd be the tightest campaign ever. Uh, we have time for one more totem because both of these are a read. Um, would you rather have me do Jekyll or American Dream? I mean, I think we've got a lot of America in us right now, but Jackal seems kind of interesting. All right, let's talk about Jackal. Well, what, was... what do you? What, what does Grim and Ham think? What do you guys think? I'm good with Jackal. All right, so Jackal was kind of sort of the original totem before Rat said, "Uh-uh, get off here. You're being. I'm. I'm the leader here." So Jackal is the dethroned bottom bitch of the tribe, and very few people follow him now. Namely, you'll get guys in Africa who will follow this guy, but um, yeah, he's fallen pretty hard out of style, and it's because of how severe his ban is. And along with that, there is a background flaw entirely dedicated to him. So, background cost 5. Garu who followed Jekyll gained 2 in survival, 1 in leadership, and the gift Blur of the Milky Eye. Each Garu in the pack also gets 1 dot of Ancestors, Every Bonar and Sun Shredder gets this benefit because some people, um, some Sun Shredders also follow Jackal, so it mentions them. But this requires them to travel on an umbral quest once per year, with or without the pack, to relieve a major experience of uh, to relive a major experience of the uh, of the ancestor. Over the course of the chronicle, the storyteller must create a background and backstory for this bygone Jackal pack. That they are following and now assuming the history of. The ban. Besides that. Jekyll rarely strikes the first blow in any fight. He waits for others to kill. If attacked, he will defend himself. But followers of this totem prefer to wait and feast off the victims that remain. 
that doesn't prevent prevent them from taunting a foe into attacking them or commanding others to attack. But as true scavengers, they prefer to export martial talents for a stronger Geru. Your pack can't attack until you are attacked first in combat. That really sucks. Yeah. That is a steep flaw, dude. Yeah, that's not that worse. Oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that is that is terrible. And you automatically start suffering from the flaw of Jekyll's blood. Meaning that money will instantly flee you the minute you get your hands on it. So, uh, wow. no resources with this guy. That sucks, dude. Yeah, that is a steep drawback. If you want to do a challenge run, take Jekyll. Holy crap, is that going to be a hell of a ride? <laughs> yeah, no shit. Jesus. And now we can finally talk about rituals. Ham, the moment you've been waiting for. All right, rituals. Uh, much like uh, literally everything else about this tribe, the rites are... They're weird. Mimi is the best way I can <laughs> describe it. Yep. Uh, do you want me to go over all of them or just one per level? Uh, one, one per, per level. level. All right. Well, sorry, right of cardboard pizza or cardboard palace. We're going right into the right <laughs> of the pizza. I'm here for it. <laughs> so essentially, you throw a pizza party. Um. <laughs> What happens is, I love the description of this because the way it's described, it's so fucking funny. So, rabble rousers sometimes try to bring Garu together by are together for a temporary enterprise by buying them food or beer, is one way of encouraging them to work together. But this minor right formally acknowledges the alliance and calls upon urban spirits for a quick blessing. So the right requires a public telephone and enough spare change for the call. <laughs> the goal is to gather enough food to feed everyone for one meal. This may seem like a simple task, but because of the wide variety of urban traditions, it's actually fraught with peril. Take, for instance, this most common application, ordering a pizza. The Garu must decide where to order the pizza from, what toppings to get, what tips sh this should be, and most distressing, who gets which slices? This can be, oh, this can, are, if they can cut, overcome this Herculean task, there is a chance they may work together to achieve greater goals. So, um, essentially, you have to roll to get our roll charisma plus rituals, then you get a uh, plus one for every tin Garu participating in the ceremony. And each success on this yields one temporary hit die for the sake of convenience, which Ooh. they named the pizza pool. Uh, yeah, so essentially it's you get everyone together. You have to divide the pizza up by the R, uh, which the highest ranking Philodox then declares the reason why the pack has been formed and then who gets what. And... To do this, it has to be a very specific goal. It can't be like nebulous, like kill the worm. But yes, this is the other one. Is essentially you make a uh, a place to sleep at night. It's essentially Liam and Sunny Hut, but with uh, cardboard. Yeah, yeah. But I, um, I really hope we get to do the right of the pizza now. You're, yeah. you're in a bar that sells pizza. Yeah, we can do the yeah. right of the pizza here. Ham, yeah, here we fucking go. ham, this is your moment. <laughs> I uh, can do the right of the pizza. Yes. We, we are going. We are probably going to end up spending all of the next episode in the stray sheep bar. I am here for it. I love this. I love this game so much. <laughs> <laughs> right, next up, we have another difficult choice with level two. Yeah, it's either the ride of crash space or the ride of the shopping cart. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm going to go with the ride of the shopping cart because, <laughs> yeah. 
So essentially, the description for this one, when the ritual is performed on any carrying space or cargo carrying device, it can expand the hold to hold more stuff, loot, or junk. In a sense, inside becomes slightly larger than the outside. Uh, but it doesn't bulge, distort, or become less easy to carry. So, yeah, you make a, essentially a mini TARDIS out of a shopping cart to hold your whatever it is you want. That's a stick. You have a secondary bag of holding. Yes. You, there's multiple avenues to get a bag of holding with a uh, Bonar. This is amazing. <laughs> I fucking it's love the, whole, the Bonars like, oh, now. What the fuck? Like all the loot you can carry with the Bonars specifically. Um, just, like, but behold, like think about all this the stuff that you need as a theurge in order to cast certain uh, certain rituals and certain uh, and get certain gifts and have uh, spirits work for you. Behold, the Bonar just has all of that on him at all times. Yeah, you just. It's in a shopping cart. We gotta give we gotta give uh Chico the right of the trench coat. <laughs> <laughs> so he just has like infinite pockets. All the different pockets you have. Uh but he, he could end up making Susie's dollar or um I keep forgetting what the coin one is called, but yeah, he's got enough pockets for those. <laughs> I think that'd be great. So the one I chose for level three is a combination of the first level uh, right uh, for the cardboard mansion and the secondary right of the shopping cart, where it is called the right of the cardboard fortress. <laughs> I love this so That's much. Amazing. <laughs> so the right of the cardboard f- fortress requires thinking outside of the box. The result would be something like this using duct tape and at least one cardboard box. The right master dedicate uh, the box. So it's much larger on the inside than it is in the outside. This involves creating a pocket realm of Umbra accessible to anyone with Gnosis trait. The box must be at least large enough for the right master to crawl inside along the flap to open and close depending on the success of the ritual once proper rites have been finished up to five garu can fit inside it with enough room to barely move around without bumping into each other in theory this space could have in theory this could square dance do calisthenics or but you couldn't play tackle football inside the box if the box is opened or destroyed and there's nothing inside, at least in the physical world, instead, Gar- Argaru may exit through their secret cardboard fortress through the Umbra. Multiple cardboard boxes can be taped together to hold multiple shape changers. <laughs> this is fucking incredible. <laughs> Do you remember the D&D spell Mordekainen's Magnificent Mention? Uh, yes. Ma- Mordekainen's Magnificent Mansion. <laughs> Yeah, we had that in uh, Descent to Avern, if I remember correctly. This. That, that, this it, is more... <laughs> bro, <laughs> Bonars are just are just wizards. No, they're they're literally Looney Tunes characters. There's like I I remember there's a there's a gift that lets you like literally just change a like a street sign around. And it throws people off your trail. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's funny. well, ham. Um, well, ham is getting a little silly. Let's go for a morbid one. Oh um, yeah. If I may read the right of man taint for a minute. Oh yes, that one. <clears throat> uh, so what this does is that you find a fucker who just ate man meat, and you grab him and you say, "You ate man meat. Spit it up." And the man meat will reform in their stomach and they will forcibly vomit it up. But or if they can't, skin. they will bleed out the flesh that they ate. That is disgusting. Yeah. That's vile. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah c- compare that to the Wendigo. <laughs> yeah. Fucking. Do that with, if you do that with the Wendigo, they just remove your rank and out all of your advancements. But. With this one, they make you go through this, and it's this is kind of worse. Honestly. Yeah, it's like no, spit it out. If you don't spit it out, you're gonna bleed it out. Yeah. Jesus. 
uh, speaking of that rattle right signpost, that's actually the next one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so right of the signpost, Bonars often surround their urban homes with awards and rituals to ex- or discourage passersby wanting to notice what's really going on in there. Through the right of the signpost, a right master slowly works his way around the, a stomping ground or an urban cairn, leaving signs or markings to intimidate, misdirect, or confuse ordinary people from wandering into the bond. Trash, graffiti, dead animals, and general signs of squalor can all convince the average human there are some darkened streets you just don't want to go down. Participating theurges and galliards stump around the area as part of this rite, as shameful as it may seem, this also involves marking a few sidewalks with urine and stink. Nice. As an, added, as an added effect of, to the successful rite, humans may get lost in the area surrounding the warded area, even a few blocks away. Garu must inhabit this area at least overnight, and you can't cast this on a random neighborhood just to confuse people. This rite can't be performed on an area largest than a single building or alleyway. If the warded area ever approaches the size of a city block, the wards begin to fail. The ward must re- be renewed each month for a can or each wing for a stomping ground. I how you actually have to stomp around in order to establish a stomping ground. And yes. I, think the, I think the Bonars have, lo- uh, have taken a cairn from the Children of Gaia. Because the COG have a cairn in San Francisco, what does San Francisco look like now? Oh my god. <laughs> I think they took most of their cairns in San Francisco. <laughs> His California has now become Bonar territory. Hey, they're, they're making yeah. waves, bro. <laughs> and the last one, level 5, right of no trespassing. Performed on Royal Cairns, this ritual keeps Bonar's most sacred places hidden from humanity. The right master enacts the help of a pack slowly working on their way around a bond or cairn. By scratching the trees and stones, marking locations with urine and scent, calling on the steadfast powers of the earth, and even hanging beware of dog signs and trespassers will be shot signs. They actively discourage humans from finding their way to the heart of the cairn if its inhabitants aren't careful, but the right forces them to take a bit of effort to actually work their way around the cairn spiritual center. So it makes it harder for everyone to move around in it. <laughs> that's kind of neat. That's, yeah. that's some big, serious don't try me energy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here for it. Yeah, they... <laughs> I love it also has that theme of they start out silly and generalist and then just become extremely good at what they do oh yeah go from being a cartoon character to genuinely competent member of the tribe yes and i I know um what's up like fucking the the guys that love having no fun with anything um rolfton said well this is offensive it's offensive to homeless people it's like that's how that whole the whole statement behind the video about saying that homeless needs to be needs to be treated with utmost respect ultimately come came across as extremely uh banal because you i know you know this uh this group arrested development yes uh, yeah 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 and their whole yeah. song mr wendell and how extremely pretentious that song was. I mean, yeah, treat humans with respect, but a homeless man is not a fountain of hidden wisdom. And it's corny and it's condescending. And what it's like this is a game. Have fun with the game. I mean, yeah, it's like have some respect for stuff, but not everything needs to be treated with like morose historical accuracy. Have fun with how you want to run the game. Yeah, it's like world of yeah. world of darkness at the end of the day, werewolf by werewolf the apocalypse is a game. And like, yeah, we are all laughing and having a great time talking about talking about the Bonars this episode because they're a fun <laughs> tribe. Like <laughs> Ham said at the beginning of the episode, this is your this is your excuse to play the murder hobo because it's fun. <laughs> yeah. This is just it's a genuinely fun tribe. If anybody has... Ryan, come... What's up? Ryan, you coming around to these guys yet? Oh, yeah. Definitely. 
Like if you if you doubt us for one second, go back and watch our live play and watch all the funny shit that 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 Chico does throughout the game. It's a fucking I, I it's can, a fucking blast to play Bonar. I, yeah. I, I, I can hear you smile when you play his character. In yeah, that it's game. Close because it's like it's an idea I always had for a character, and then it's like, oh wait, Bonars exist, and they are this trope. It works perfect for it. And not only that, it's like the more you put, they're also one of the biggest cases of be careful who you make fun of at rank one, because these guys get scary powerful. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. It's it's also kind of funny because you played our one sane man in Out of the Abyss with Hamiltoni, and even though Chico is a very wacky character, he's honestly the most sane out of the, out of the pack. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, he's... He is sober to reality. It knows how bad it can fucking get so quickly. Because <laughs> we've got we've got Katsuki Bakugo as a werewolf with Grimm. We've got uh Walt off the front page of Fur Affinity with with Tyler. Yeah, sorry about that. And and <laughs> and keeping secrets with Mepian, his uh Elmira is not as simple as you think she is. I'm excited. So. <laughs> I'm excited to see to see her character flourish. I'm I'm really excited for Elmira as a character. So funny enough, a character as goofy as the Bonar is the most sane member of the tribe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I honestly I really love Chico playing the straight man for all of us. <laughs> most sane member of the pack. All right, combining splats. Next up in our long list of combining. Uh, werewolf tribes fighting vampire clans. I think I told you before that I was going to have this be Clan Rathnos, but I've changed my mind. It's After the history we've talked about, it's no secret that the Bonars and the, um, and the Bruja... The Giovanni. Well, yeah, that too. Like, either Bruja or Giovanni would work as, like, suitable rivals to the, to the Bonars. But, but here's the thing. We already paired the Bruja with the Glasswalkers. That's and true. We already paired, and we already paired the Giovanni with the Red Talons. So who would it and be then? Going, to, going down the line, Fiala versus Setite, Wendigo versus Banu Hakim, Silent Starters versus Malkavians, Black Furries versus Nosferatu, Children of Gaia versus La Sombra. I thought about it. I started looking through histories of vampire clans. And then I realized the clan, the, the tribe that's all about philanthropy should be paired against the the tribe that is nothing but selfish bastards screwing over their own clan for their own advancement. And Zemichi. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As you think about it, and once again, I, I didn't pick this just because uh, Ham played a Zemichi in our vampire game, but um, no coincidence, right? No, but yeah, but yeah. You look. You look at the history of clans of Michi. I'm posting their um glyph and history pages. Yeah. This is a clan that has very few accomplishments, because the only tribe they enjoy killing more than other, uh, the only clan they enjoy killing more than other clans, is themselves. Clan Zemichi is constantly at war with itself, because of how the path of metamorphosis works, and the demon brain waves you get from vicissitude. You are a monster who is constantly turning off their human pieces one by one until you are eventually nothing but your beast. And you want to reach that point. You want to be disgusting. You want to be ugly. And you can't cooperate when you're like that. You remember that scene from The Fly? Uh, I want to be the first insect politician. In insects are very brutal. Insects don't exactly have compassion. That's what you do with the Zemichi. You do that in reverse. You go from being compassionate to being a devil. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. pairing these guys up with, a, with probably the most good-hearted, tender-hearted tribe, the Bonars, that just makes sense to me. Yeah, you get the yeah. absolute most selfish and fucking brutal bastards who will stab anyone in the back to make themselves more powerful fighting against the one tribe of Garrow that actually seems to care about everybody. 
Uh, yeah. Some people more than others because the rich can go get fucked, right? Yeah, obviously. <laughs> well, in this modern day and age, a lot of people shouldn't sentiment. Yes. Um, Sorry, next uh, up, Ham, you were gonna you were gonna say something? Oh no, I was just like, yeah, I was honestly thinking about the same thing. How they are the opposite of Zamichi, where yeah, they're good in every way. Zamichi fails. Exactly. Look at how many people. Look at how many people Count Dracula shared his throne with. Zero. It's gonna be me and only me, and that's the most operandi of the of the Zamichi. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm thinking about too. The Lasabra would be better off by themselves running the Sabat instead of having the Zamichi with them, because so many plans that the Sabat tried to do are thwarted by their own Zamichi. But it's like the glass workers because you can't tell the Zamichi to leave because the Zamichi are the Zamichi. <laughs> so you're stuck with these guys. Yeah, basically. I mean Yeah. You look you look at this guy, you look at him, and he's got all these different uh, body parts hanging off of him. And I'll I'll pull up our, our um asset for Grisha. <laughs> oh boy. Oh wait, uh old you Grisha went... from the from the older game? Yeah. Okay. Uh Dear Chip is the artist that draws a lot of characters that I use for uh, Zumichi for Zumichi vampires. You tell this guy he's fired from the Sabbat. Oh no, he'll right. just he'll he'll kill everybody that you look that 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 looks at him. Then <laughs> the beauty of the Zulu war form. Yeah, I want to call that beauty. I mean, it is it is really cool looking, at least. I've spent all this money and killed all these people to turn myself into a dragon. Yep. But hey, I got wings, so worth. Yeah. Combining, um, Bonars with other changing breeds, uh, Ratkin. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, alternatively, hyena is a totem that they like. So you can have a game that's the inverse. You can have them team up with the Ajaba in Africa instead. After all, these guys did start in Africa. And you can have the Libon fight you. You can have the Simba, the the rare lions that nobody likes as the villain. Yeah, it'd be kind and of the whole the And the Chronicle will write itself. Yeah, just have a whole wild Chronicle. That'd be really sick. And in terms of the girl, I think these guys, first of all, they know the girl exists, <laughs> unlike some other <laughs> tribes. Yeah. The the Fianna, the girl, are out there, just step outside of Boston and find a bear. It's simple as that. Look, we're, <laughs> look, a lot of the Fianna are homebodies. Say, I might be able to do that because I'm a wandering rover, and I'll t and I'll be the first to spread the word if I do find a girl. Because trust me, I missed him as much as every other fan of that that's ever known about him. Uh, uh, the uh, the entry they had about the Bastet saying, "Oh, the poor Bastet, they all died in the War of Rage," and yet the Kwame and the Pumoka are doing very well in America. <laughs> yep. Uh, alternatively, you can have these guys. Have a whole Bonar versus Ananasi campaign, given that the Ananasi are corrupting the glass workers. So, um, do a covert war of rage with your Bonars, and make sure you actually get all the Ananasi this time. I Yeah, that'd be pretty neat as well. Yeah, who knows, you might actually redeem the glass workers this time. The glass workers openly deny that they have ties with the Ananasi, and we know that's not true. Oh yeah. They look. They they just want any new cool shit. They don't care if they are gonna eventually get droned. Well, they they are Militech from from Cyberpunk. Yeah, they are. They really are. Next up, uh, Hunter the Reckoning. Um, have a hunter as an antagonist. Goal of the game: don't get caught. Fun little cat. It could be a game. That could be a pretty political game too, considering uh, it could be like um, the rich trying to call the weak, like put some neoliberal themes in it too. But also, I'm thinking of a trap because you know a bunch of churches will want to how um, some churches will house. Um, why am I saying this wrong? House homeless people. Uh, behold, you just stepped into a Church of Saint Leopold trap. 
Oh yeah, that then it becomes like a house of horror. That'd be cool. And then you have to like yeah, run through it, it turns into an outlast game. As we as we were right behind you about to smote you with the fire of Mount Sinai. And uh who's next? Uh changelings. Uh really just name any changeling kith and they can get along with the bonars. Uh that granted the bonars don't really think highly of the changelings, but it can still work. I mean, like, hey, you I mean, could you could get like a boggin or a knocker to help you, or especially a knocker to help you build a, a new cardboard box. Mm-hmm. And uh, you also have the slew. I can help you navigate the sewer systems if the if the Nosferatu are being finicky that day. Yep. Um, next up, Wraith the Oblivion. Uh, the story writes itself. I mean, as we said, a lot of the new places these guys will sleep are haunted. So behold, in your Wraith the Oblivion game, you're trying to be a Wraith, you're in the Skinlands for a little bit, you see a wolf lay down, and this wolf looks like a man, what's going on here? And boom, there's your session. Yeah, I think that... Easy enough. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the scenarios of the Bonars, given how versatile they are, are really easy to put together. And they're friggin' everywhere. Yeah. Now the question, Demon of Fallen. That's a hard one. Yeah, uh, just as I said that, we get the hard one. Uh, Demon of Fallen. Well, I could see this working because you said, as we said, they don't really know that much about mages because they think hollow men are intelligent mages and they think sw- the Pepsi trick was good. <laughs> That's going to get you killed, dude. I like Pepsi. Um, the Celestial Chorus probably could be an ally of them, now come to think of it. If it's not the Church of St. Leopold trying to kill you, it's the Celestial Chorus giving you a, a real help, helping hand. Uh, there, was, there is no way they would work with the Sons of Ether or Virtual Adepts. Absolutely not. Oh, no. Far um, too Weaver. I'm thinking about other brother uh, traditions. I don't really see them work, working with any one tradition in particular. No, they might, like, ask some people for help, but I think the Hollow Men, as dangerous as they are, would still make for an interesting Looney Tunes campaign. I'm, I'm trying to think of how they could work with the Verbena. The the Pagan Mages. I, um, hmm. Well, I probably could see it more as, like, a Spend Dr. Verbena coming into their camera and saying... Uh, hey, you guys are worshipping rats. I happen to have a convenient rat god with me. Here's a scroll. And then you have a spend Dr. Verbena take over a cairn that way. Yeah, that'd be neat. So you can have a Verbena antagonist for a game with with uh, with Bonars. A Demon of Fallen, I'm thinking too. A lot of these demons actually hang out in cities. As we saw with the, the Stargazers. Because they were going through the streets of, I think it was New York or, no, Hong Kong. And I saw a guy get attacked and pushed into a puddle and then stabbed to death ritualistically. You can have the same situation like that happen with a Bonar. Oh yeah, except in New York. I mean, given all the calamity happening in uh, big cities these days and the rise of neo-paganism, demons are eating pretty well. (laughs) Yeah, they really are. In our modern day. Speaking uh, of, I was at work. I saw a dude with like a cross, with like... A red cross through a cross oh, a tattoo on his shoulder today. And I'm like, that guy uses Reddit. That guy is a Satanist. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Did, did you guys see the man from Brazil that spent like a whole bunch of money on plastic surgery to become Satan? No. no. I've seen the guy that did that with the lizard, and that was always how I wanted to play a lizard folk in D&D. Yeah. Oh, cool. It's yeah, just, he got this that guy. <laughs> You got this freak of nature right here. Like, you could, like, Bonars meet a whole bunch of weird people. You can meet this guy. You can meet the guy who turned himself into Satan. There he is. Yeah. All right, that that should be just... that should be a totem in the game. Yeah, he, how did he fork his tongue? That's pretty yeah, well, fucked. Well, well, he met a very sadistic uh, surgeon who didn't say no. That's how it happened. Jesus. That always <laughs> fucked of me up. Like, you... that must make it really hard to swallow food. On top of that, he cut off his fucking ring finger just so he could have four fingers on his hand. The, why the G- ring great finger? Great idea, right? <laughs> I, it's like, for marriage, that's why. Dude, people are fucking stupid. 
So, of course, you can run into, like, a freak of nature like this. And you as a bonar, you meet freaks every day. You don't think it's a big deal, but no, it turns out it's actually a demon this time. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine just how far south that day could go. It's like, hey, can you see that weird-looking dude walking down the street? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen him. You know he's actually a demon, There's right? Also... He's a fucking what? There's another... Sean recommended me yesterday a, a series, it's on the Roku channel, called American Gods. Mm -hmm. where It's all these like old gods that have lost their power and are living as normal people in New York City that are fighting for power against new gods, like gods of the American dollar. Oh, and that sounds neat. you can have a Bonar get involved in that game, where say, you're playing a Demon of Fallen game, and you contact Bonars and say, I have resources... I can start feeding you if you assist me. But you need to disguise yourself. Do not let somebody know that you're a demon. You are going to get jumped by everybody if they figure that out. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's a demon. It's scary as shit. Just disguise yourself as either a Nosferatu or probably probably the, um, the, the hollow ones. And maybe you can get somewhere with your demon the Fallen game. Yep. With the Bonars. And uh, that's the tribe. Yeah, I I I initially didn't have a whole lot to think about the Bonars, and now I'm like, holy shit, these guys are awesome. This is a really fun tribe. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> uh, Grammy, uh, Ryan, you got any ideas? Nope, I can't think of nope. anything. Nope. Uh, there we go. We said all that needs to be said. Uh, Ham, anything from you? Oh uh, no. Nah. Like I said, they're a, they're a fun tribe. They are probably the one that like embraces the kind of silliness of this setting the most. It it's bleak, but you can have a lot of fun with the bleakness. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like yeah, the world's ending. There's chaos and panic in the streets. There's fucking terrifying creatures of evil wandering around. But hey, sit down by the fire. Have some stew with me. Yeah. And after all, the all of these guys going to laugh at you when they survive the the apocalypse and you die. Yep. Come into my little cardboard house. It's actually a lot roomier than you think. And then he's got like a coffee table, a couple of torn leather couches, and a mini fridge in there. We have twenty years worth of peach preserves to eat while we wait for the nuclear fallout to dissipate. Yep. A thousand cans of chowder and a thousand cans of beer. Yeah, that's going to be some severe cabin fever. A little bit. <laughs> hey here's an idea put the beer in the chowder and there you go there's your cooking gift yeah great <laughs> yep this tribe's fun play the bonars yes yeah. they are Raps very added. fun uh, and I think that's a wrap we got it this time yep good night everybody alright GM have a good night, night. have a good night